Uh, good morning and welcome to the third meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone present to ensure their mobile phones are on silent for the duration of the meeting. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. Uh, that covers items four and five. Are we agreed? agreed. We are agreed. Thank you. Um, the second item on the agenda this morning is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's draft climate change plan, RPP3. The draft plan was laid on the 20th of January 2017. The Parliament has 60 days to consider this document. The, this committee will be carrying out its scrutiny in collaboration with the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee, the Rural Economy uh, Committee and the Local Government and Communities Committee. Last week, the committees launched a joint call for written evidence, and I would encourage as many people as possible to send us their views. The committee has a full schedule of meetings planned at, uh, at which to consider the oral evidence. Uh, at our meeting on the 31st of January, we'll be joined by stakeholders to discuss the overview of the plan and climate change governance. On the 7th of February, we'll be taking evidence from two panels of stakeholders on issues relating to specific sections of the plan within this committee's remit. We will be looking at resource use, the water industry, the public sector, peatland and land use. Uh, on the 21st of February, we'll then take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. Uh, this meeting represents the first of our oral evidence sessions, and we've been joined by a number of Scottish Government officials who are leading or led on the development of the document. Uh, Chris Stark, Director of Energy and Climate Change, John Allen, Deputy Director of Decarbonisation, Colin McBean, who's the Head of Energy and Climate Change Analysis, uh, Morag Williamson, the Team Leader of the Climate Change Plan Project Team. Uh, good morning to you all. Um, as we have rather a lot of ground um, to cover, we'll uh, crack on. Um, I'd like to ask a question just for clarity. The Cabinet Secretary's foreword to the document says, and I quote, each sector's needs are now interlinked in the modelling. If one sector over or underperforms against their expectation, we can now model the knock-on impact on emissions savings required from those other sectors of the economy in the future. I'm just a little bit concerned about the messaging around that, because it could be interpreted as saying that, say, uh, we perform far better than expected in one sector, then we might throttle back in another as we move forward. Um, I'm hoping this is just a clumsy use of words, but it's worth clarifying that the targets being set, however challenging, would be ones we would be seeking not only to reach, but surpass sector by sector. So can I get an answer around that, please? I think <clears throat> there is a distinction. <clears throat> Sorry, my apologies. I think one way of, of, of looking at that is to think about the, the point that the Cabinet Secretary made, um, I think, in front of this committee that, um, before about, about sectoral targets and ha the, the carbon budgets which are in this, that it's very much the, the government's position that um, whilst we work within sectoral envelopes and the plan contains you know, very specific sectoral envelopes, that there is a great advantage in maintaining those as sectoral envelopes rather than sectoral targets. Because if you have sectoral targets, that removes a degree of flexibility. But I don't think that there's any sense of you know, um, choking back. I, I, I just think it's that we're, we're, we're taking a sort of a, a sectoral envelope approach rather than a sectoral budget, um, rather than a sectoral target approach. Uh, but I'd like to be clearer on this. If we had a situation where, let's take a, a sector, um, let's say transport, was um, doing particularly well, it wouldn't, would it or would it not create a potential situation where, say, agriculture was lagging behind, that the view was taken, well, overall, we're on course in a particular year? Depends really at the point at which that's happening. So the current act builds into this in, in, into, you know, into its requirements that every five years or so, when you set the annual targets, that you derive a new plan. And what we've done in each of those plans in RPP1, RPP2, and the, the current climate change plan, RPP3, is we've taken at that point a sort of a, a view about the balance between, between sectors. And on this occasion, you remember, we've used the Times model to assist us in taking that view. And I would imagine that it would, it would be entirely consistent with both the Act and the approach that we have taken in our previous RPPs and this one, 
every five years or so to have a look at um, where you put your effort and, and where the effort is best placed. So I don't think this is writing things in tablets of stone for the eternity of the, you know, up to 2050. I think there's a sense at which you would need to look at this every five years or so when you produce a new climate change plan. Mm, or perhaps more frequently than every five years. Um, uh, Finlay Carson. What I would like to explore initially is uh, emission envelopes. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, a, a set of two questions. How uh, were the emission envelopes developed uh, and how was agreement uh, taken between the different sectors in the Scottish Government? Uh, was there any conflict in agreeing those emission envelopes between the different uh, sectors? And also, uh, what advice was sought from the, the Committee on Climate Change and how to, to take these uh, factors into account? If, if perhaps I should give an overview of that and my colleagues Chris and Colin can, can chip in, if that might, might, might help you. Um, as you'll remember, that we, the, the broad approach that we've taken here is that we have taken the, we've invested quite heavily in this TIMES model. And this TIMES model is, is, is a model which is used internationally for climate change and energy modelling. It's used to inform decisions like the one that we're doing here, but typically it's used outside of government. We've been quite, I think, unique in using it with inside government. And what the TIMES model allows us to do is it allows us to think about sort of where to put effort in terms of societal cost. And the idea is that the TIMES model will provide you with the, the least cost way in societal terms of hitting the climate change targets. And that is a, one of the starting points that we took. The other starting point that we took was the, was the advice from the Committee on Climate Change. Um, they adopt a different approach. They don't use times models. They, they use an approach similar to the one we used in RPP2, which is to sort of start at the bottom and build upwards rather than allocating effort from the top down. So we took, we took um, the, the Committee on Climate Change advice, and we took the output of the times model, and we also took input from stakeholders like Stop Climate Chaos, who, who provided a number of very helpful case studies. In determining those envelopes, I think the Times model was our, was our key driver, and we, we made use, and um, we took this to the Cabinet Subcommittee, and the Cabinet Secretary took it to the Cabinet Subcommittee, um, and there was a discussion there. Um, the Cabinet Subcommittee took the Times runs, um, and they also balanced this against deliverability issues um, around social welfare issues, um, such as things like fuel poverty, um, and also you know, economic growth and the need to maintain economic growth. So <clears throat> as the Cabinet dis Subcommittee discussions proceeded, um, there was a mo modification of the initial times run, and that moved us towards um, a proposal for Cabinet, and there was also a Cabinet discussion. And that's roughly the process we followed. I don't know if Chris or Colin would like to add anything to that. No, I just to add, I suppose the, the key components of that are that um, we're using the model not only as a diagnostic tool, but actually as a, a way to constrain decision making. And the way that that then works is that you require cabinet or a subcommittee of cabinet to make those decisions collectively. So times, times, the times when we run it gives, gives an early assessment of how you might allocate the carbon and then we assess that against the priorities of each of the cabinet secretaries. Okay, just, just in the back of that, you, you may have answered it already, but what, what's the justification for the, the significant variations in, in the planned emissions reduction? Uh, by sector. So, for example, we're looking at agriculture set to fall by 12% uh, compared to 76% reduction in the residential sector, and, and you know we're predicting to uh, remove emissions completely from the <coughs> electricity sector. Can you give me some information on that? But also, with that in mind, what level of consensus existed across the, 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 the various uh, stakeholders? Uh, when, it, when it comes to making decisions like that? Um, well, it's basically a product of that collective decision-making process. So it's the assessment, it's the collective assessment of the analysis that we provide using times, plus the views of external stakeholders and, and issues like economic impact, but crucially also the package of proposals that delivers each envelope for each, um, each sector. So you are seeing there, I suppose, the product of that collective decision-making process. And that, that answers the final part of your question. It, it is a collectively uh, agreed position um, amongst the various cabinet secretaries. So, so there was consensus, even though some of the targets are yeah. far, more, far higher than others, there was, there was, there was government? Yeah. 
um, two, two points here. Um, we're still looking for an answer on the role of the Committee on Climate Change. I mean, they gave advice prior to the plan being prepared. I'm interested in whether they had any sight of the plan before it was published. But the other point, pick, picking up on Finlay Carson's question, is if you look at agriculture, um, if, I, if memory serves, between 1990 and 2014, agriculture's cut in emissions was about 14%, and that was heavily criticised as being inadequate. Now we're in a situation where essentially everyone has to step up to the mark, and this plan requires a 12% cut, albeit over a shorter period. Um, can you outline for us what the thinking was behind that target being set in agriculture? I think one of the, the important things of this, and, um, and one of the um, points that was quite frequently raised with us um, during this process, was a sense of fairness between the sectors. And I think that's what you might have been getting at too, that you know, why is this sector having to do a lot more, and why is this sector having to do a lot less? And I think that lies behind your question around agriculture. And I think this basically comes to the really big difference between how RPP2 was done and how RPP3 was done. So if you remember in the RPP2 thing, what we did in essence was we sort of asked all of the sectors how much of a contribution can we, could they make. And lying behind our sense of whether they were doing well enough was some sort of sense of equity in, in, in the sense of we, um, there needs to be some sort of degree of equal effort between sectors. Now, obviously, that was modified in RPP2 by, again, practical considerations. But the great advantage of times is it, it actually allows us to look at the cost, the societal cost of pushing hard. And, it, it, you know, and one of the very clear things I think that came from running times was that it is very, very difficult and expensive to reduce emissions in, in what some sectors rather than in others. So the fact that um, the electricity sector is almost decarbonized pointed to the, the relative you know, um, low societal cost of doing that relative to the relatively high societal cost of doing a similar sort of decarbonization in agriculture. And if you think through agriculture, you know, I, and the fact that most of the emissions are biologically driven so they're, they're the result of you know, nitrous oxide and methane, as opposed to carbon dioxide. Um, that gives us a sort of sense of, of where we are. So if you look at the agriculture sector in, 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 in some detail, what you'll see is the, the use of fossil fuels within agriculture you know, is subject to reasonably similar constraints as the rest of the economy. So in that sense, that's what you'd expect. But when you start to having to, re, to work with these biological processes around the use of fertilizer, um, and methane production from ruminants, it starts to become much, much more difficult. And that's, in a sense, what that balance of emissions reduction comes from. Yeah, but the UKCCC? The UKCC, um, they gave their advice. Um, we had conversations um, with them around how you use times models and the distinctions between times models and their approach. Um, they didn't see the final plan before it was published. That was because of the, the, the cabinet process behind that. Can I just return to this point about agriculture? The section in the document, Pathway to 2032, identifies targets for a number of sectors, challenging targets in many cases, industrial waste, peatland, woodland, for example. But the language around the agricultural sector is quite interesting because the use of words such as expect, encourage, work with, uh, when many of us might have wanted to see the word require in there, it seems to me that... that and I hate to use the phrase agriculture is getting off lightly because I hear what you said, Mr Ireland, but there is a, t a tone to this that suggests that, that agriculture is getting an easy ride here. I don't think that's the case. I, I, you know, I think the, the work from Times illustrates they're not getting a, an easy ride. And I think the, the, the other element here is, and you know, your other committees will see this when they take evidence from, from the relevant cabinet secretaries, that there's a very strong sense that we, you know, of working with the industry within, within there as well. So um, although you know, there are things which you know, there, there's more sort of you know, push behind perhaps, in order to operationalize these, you know, working with the industry is particularly important, particularly important in this sector. Claudia Beamish. Just a quick follow-up. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, in relation to agriculture, I'd just like to push that a little further, if I may. And, um, uh, John, you've highlighted the societal costs of um, decision-making and also the, the, 
the actual financial costs as well. Um, I, I, I'm just trying to understand this a bit more clearly for my own benefit and for the record. If you take electricity, uh, I, I'm not sure, and I'm only posing the question, perhaps it can't be answered today, but I'm not sure that we would be where we are now with electricity if there hadn't been very clear Scottish Government and previously UK Government direction in relation to regulation and a lot of grants and, and, and those sort of aspects of it. So I ask myself, having taken a keen interest in the last, um, uh, in the last committee on, on agriculture, and trying to continue to do so, from this perspective at least, um, why that's not, is that, or I'll put it as a question, is that not factored in if you look at the possibilities through organics or um, agroecology or agroforestry and, and those contributions, um, is there any way in which the grants could be pushed further on those so that there could be opportunities uh, for that sort of a transition, which is perhaps more just like it was from fossil fuels to electric um, renewables. I hope I'm being clear. I hope it's not too... I think the... I think there are two elements to, to, to what you're asking, um, perhaps, that, um, well, three elements. There's the, the comparison with electricity, which perhaps Chris might like to say something about in, in a minute. But then there's also, when, when looking at agriculture, there are, there are, I suppose there are two ways of sort of, two or three way, different ways of, of moving things forward. Um, and obviously the first way is, is, is through regulation. Uh, the second way is to perhaps through using grants. And the, the third way is through, um, encouraging farmers to understand that there are things which are not only good for the planet but also good for their own pockets a sort of more voluntary type approach and i think that you know the approach that the, you know the cabinet secretary in this area is taking is to get across a message that not only is low carbon low carbon farming good for the planet but it's also good for producers pockets and that's very much the sort of the starting point there are other things, um, like there is sort of compulsion here. And, you know, for example, you know, we previously announced our intention to move to compulsory soil testing, and compulsory soil testing is, is, is one of the things, um, or soil testing is one of the things um, where there are great benefits for farmers at a sort of, you know, the bottom line. But, you know, there's a very clear acknowledgement that we need to take food, food producers and farmers along, along with us. So that they realise that you know low carbon farming is not only good for the planet but for good for their pockets. So this sort of sense, although there is a sort of you know a compulsory, you know, we, the government has been very clear about compulsory soil testing, so the regulation approach. Um, you know, there's a very strong acknowledgement, and you know that we need to take people along with us. And I think I think that's the really important thing to understand when you're looking at the agriculture chapter. So a very a very strong desire to work with farmers and food producers to get across the message that um, low, car low, farming, low carbon farming benefits the planet, so you know, it's really important, but it's good for them too at a personal level. Okay. F Finley Carson. <laughs> the back of that, we're talking about uh, improved profitability for farming, and I don't think it's lost on anybody that soil plays a big part in that, and maybe the reductions in inputs will actually result in an increase in outputs. Was that taken into consideration when you looked at the cost of getting the 12% reduction, that there actually was potentially an increase in profitability for agriculture? Was that taken into consideration? And the yeah. cost, the return on investment, if you like? Yes, and I think that's true across the whole piece, that um, we, one of the, you know, the ways in which we sort of took the, the time's output and started to, to, to think about sort of how we translate that into envelopes, um, very much did involve, um, you know, first of all, a sense of sort of, you know, how easy it is to move in this direction because of the, those sort of, it, it's good for both the individual farmer um, or, say, the individual household in terms of energy efficiency um, as well as society, so there's an investment there, but also um, those non-monetary benefits. So if you improve the, the use of um, fertiliser, you know, that has other non-carbon benefits um, for society and, and that, that those sort of benefits were factored into the consideration as well. Uh, good morning. Um, just to come back to the convener's point about the wording within the climate plan, wh when you talk about expecting farmers to be undertaking soil testing by 2018, what, what exactly does that mean? 
does that mean that there will be compulsory soil testing in 2018 for all farmers? Or is it that we're in a process of negotiation with the NFUS about the best way to do this and it may take five or six years to achieve, but we'll start it next year? So my understanding is, is very much that we, um, the government um, announced its intention to move to compulsory testing some time ago. And I think the, um, Ms Cunningham sort of commented upon that in the chamber as well um, last week. But there's a very clear acknowledgement that we need to take food producers and farmers with us. Yeah. So that's my understanding. What does that mean then for next year? When, when I read that you expect farmers to be soil testing next year, what, what exactly does that mean? Is that hope or so the compulsion? The policy on compulsory soil testing has not changed since it was set in June 2015. So that is our expectation that that policy will remain in place. Implemented in this time frame. Mm -hmm. Right. I think this is something we need to explore with the Scottish Government. Okay. Okay. Uh, we content to move on. Um, Alexander Burnett. Thank you, Kalina. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to learn a bit more about the Times model, and can I thank Chris and his team for the additional session uh, they gave to ex explain, and I'm sure it'll be a subject we're going to have to learn a lot more about uh, coming. Um, can you just ask, answer what information the model provides on expected emission abatement associated with achieving each policy outcome, and whether the model provides information on the abatement costs, such as pounds per tonne of carbon, for each policy outcome derived, and if so, why isn't this detail provided in the draft report? Um, I think I'll start off and then hand over to Colin. Um, I think this, this is something we, we, we talked about um, in some detail when we gave the informal um, presentation um, before Christmas, and I'm, I think it's important that we come back to that. Because it, you know, there's a very clear difference between RPP2 and the current plan in terms of the sort of the information it provides about sort of um, abatement at the sort of individual policy level and also cost at the individual policy level. So I think it's important that we, we, we do explore this. Um, there is a difference and that difference in essence comes from how the Times model operates um, and Colin will explain that. But also there's, there, there's a fundamental difference that we're now in a much better position um, to understand abatement across the piece. And it's, it's very much our view that the, sort of the numbers in RPP2 are less useful than we thought at the time because we have much, a much better understanding about sort of how abatement operates as a system. And that's the whole point of the Times model. And I think with that sort of introduction, I think handing over to Colin would probably help. Okay. So thanks very much. The, as you've discussed already, the Times model is a whole system energy model. Fundamentally, that really changes the way we have to conceive um, the problem of carbon abatement, not least because the model is actually a dynamic system. So when we pull on um, one sector or expect something to happen in one place, there are ripples that go right across and right through the modelling process. So you're not in the position, for example, where you have a single price of carbon for a particular policy measure coming forward because the costs that that policy is facing are directly implemented, affected rather, by the costs that are showing up elsewhere in the system. So if the system, for example, take biomass as an example, if the system is drawing biomass into, say, heating, then that biomass is no longer available for any other process in the model or is only available for another process at an increased price. So it means that you really have to consider the full systemic picture rather than zooming in on an individual component as you would have been able to historically. Now the strength of that is it allows us to be confident about the overall system cost that we're facing because we're not losing as we might have done in previous approaches the costs that are happening on an intra-air rather than intra-sectoral basis. So where for example we're pulling forward low carbon electricity the model is actually forcing us to build um, the technologies to supply that electricity, and then we're taking that and checking that the transmission system is actually capable of dealing with those flows. So we don't have the unanswered question at the back of our minds about what happens when we electrify uh, transport or how far we can electrify heat before we start to run into large unexpected costs. And that's why we've been able to 
put for the first time an overall um, value to society on the whole package of measures, um, which is the figure you'll have seen referenced in the briefing and in the document itself, um, at around 2% of cumulative GDP running forward. Thank you. So, so I understand there's a, a, a final total based on a set of constraints. So do you keep a, is there a record of what different constraints were used during the process? Does the Scottish Government keep a, keep a list of the different model runs? Yeah, yes, we do. We have a full, a full audit trail back of each of the model changes that we've, that we've made. So we first received the model in uh, January this year. And we've moved forward a combination of tightening up some of the technical constraints. So, for example, we had discussions around biomass that led to us actually tightening um, the biomass constraints in the model and also policy constraints. So, for example, um, around uh, heating, um, the model, when it's left to run itself, would like to uh, change over to gas boilers very quickly. Um, however, if you do that, that you're doing that, you're making that decision on the basis of the information the model currently knows. And we know that there's a lot of discussion going on at um, a UK level and wider about the prospects of repurposing the gas grid. So if you took a naive modelled approach, you would just jump immediately into a position of starting to uh, decommission um, parts of that grid, whereas a more nuanced um, position is to try and minimise the potential for regret moving forward and use the model to actually inform those decisions, which is why you'd see in the plan the heavy focus on SEEP and uh, reducing um, demand first and then moving on to low carbon heating technologies in the second half of the plan, which is in line with the timescales that we're seeing for decisions about alternative fuel sources coming forward. I can I ask if there are any plans to publish any of these different sets of constraints that were used? We can certainly make those available, yeah, Very good. no problem. Uh, and just finally, um, uh, you know, given the... the uh, uh, process uh, completed, uh, can I just ask what you're, uh, what you're doing and we're reviewing the Times model going forward or, or discussion about that? So we've been given um, permission to make the, the model um, open source and available to academics, so we're currently in a position of uh, tidying it so that it can be handed, handed over to academics and we're also in the process of arranging for one of my staff to spend some time so we can work with the academics to bring them up to, up to speed, I'm sure they'll very quickly pass us by, but just in that initial handover period. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Uh, could we uh, look a bit further at the uh, wider benefits and multiple benefits of um, the, the plan? Um, and it would be interesting for the committee, and I think um, the wider public for the record, to hear um, how are opportunities to secure wider benefits, such as um, related to human health or biodiversity or to jobs, for instance, indeed, um, the possible of, possibility of manufacturing new technology, um, to just give three examples, um, or the, the point that um, John's already highlighted about uh, fuel poverty, I think. How were they assessed and how is that reflected in the model development um, and selection of policies and proposals? It's a very broad, quite detailed question, I know, but if we can begin to tease that out a bit more. I think it's a very helpful question, again. Um, I think from the start of this process, we've been particularly concerned that we take account of these wider non-carbon benefits. Um, at the RPP2 level, um, there was a general sort of a sense of awareness of them, um, but we didn't have an awful lot of information on them. Um, and particularly as we move to a times model which um, looks at societal costs, but societal costs in very much in the sense of the, the capex and the operating costs of the sort of the, the energy system. So it's, it's quite a broad definition of cost which times looks at, and it's a massive step forward, but it doesn't include these non-carbon benefits. So we're very, very clear that what we wanted to do is we wanted to have good quality information on those um, non-carbon benefits to, to put aside the times runs themselves. And so what we did was we commissioned um, literature reviews of the evidence on non-carbon benefits in three key sectors, um, and that's the built environment, the, the transport sector, and the agriculture sector, land use sector, more widely, sorry. Um, so we have published, and you can see these on the website, they were published on last Thursday, you've got them there, great, um, some very detailed um, 
evidence reviews of the sorts of benefits that you got from various non from various mitigation policies, but for other things. And I think that was helpful because that allowed us to give ministers a, a clear sense of those and to give our colleagues developing policies and proposals across the government a clear sense of those. So that was the point of that. How, how were these taken on board? Um, well, we didn't take them on board in a, in, in, you know, a very sort of, well, you know, there's an extra pound here. So we didn't do that very, very formal cost-benefit analysis um, because you know, that's quite hard to combine with the sort of the times technology because we don't have that sort of overall. We just have you know, extensive information on, on, on these three quite important sectors. So it's very much a judgment process. Um, but it was very clearly factored into, into how we sort of modified the times runs from the least cost run, our starting point. And it was very much sort of in the minds of um, our co policy colleagues, but also um, members of the Cabinet Subcommittee and the, of Cabinet when those decisions were taken. So when, when Cabinet and the Cabinet Subcommittee looked at the sort of the, the, the time, the envelopes generated by, by times, there's a very clear sense in their minds about how they would want to sort of modify those to take account of these non-carbon benefits. Thank you. And is that, I haven't made the time yet to delve into these. Is, is that, for instance, on fuel poverty, would that be highlighted how um, that uh, that target having been missed and and going forward the challenges of meeting it and and the importance of that for um, people on low incomes and rural dwellers would that be something that we could look at in here to see if that altered any decision making process within policy makers or whether it whether it went to the I, I don't expect detail of the the subcommittee, but whether that informed the process. It did inform the process in the sense that fuel poverty um, and the importance of warmer homes um, was, was very, a very strong factor in how we arrived at the residential envelope. Um, and there's a very strong focus in the, the first 10 years of the, the plan on energy efficiency measures um, in the domestic sector. And you know, that comes from our, the government's concern around fuel poverty and around the non-carbon benefits of, you know, the health benefits of warmer homes. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it's a very, the fuel poverty example is a very good example. The other examples are um, where we can see that there's a wider economic benefit, for example, for investment in a particular technology or in a particular sector. So, yes, we, that was absolutely fundamental to the advice to ministers around all these issues. And indeed, many of the discussions with ministers jointly were around the impacts in the long run, around those um, what we occasionally call co-benefits or non-carbon benefits from these issues. Could you say something specifically about biodiversity in view of the previous com conversation and discussion we've had about um, the agriculture sector and, and the, the concerns about those targets for 2020? I, I, I think all I can say was that, again, these were, you know, the, the, these factors were, you know, because we had commit, um, we did have the evidence on land use. Um, the, the work on agriculture, for example, um, you know, was done, um, there was a fair amount of stakeholder contacts, both with um, NUFS um, and also with the, with the NGOs. So those biodiversity factors were very much part of those conversations and very much in the mind of, of cabinet secretaries as they made these decisions. So would you say that, that, uh, that there were any changes reflected because of those discussions? Are you able to tell us that? I think beyond saying that those things are in the mind, <clears throat> Of, of people, um, I'm not sure I could sort of point to a particular decision and say, well, that would have been different if we hadn't have had that piece of evidence, for sure. But that, yeah, the process wasn't like that, as I was trying to explain earlier. But um, it's very much part of the mix of, of, of considerations, yes. Okay. Okay. Mark Roskill. How does that then fit with the budget setting process? Because effectively, you've now got a document which has actions across government um, there are some quite ambitious trajectories here in different sectors, uh, and clearly that has an impact on the objectives of different departments. Um, but there's also a budgetary implication as well. It's not clear within the document what the long-term budgetary implications are, or even what the scale of ambition is relevant to current budgets. So I think that's an, a, a really fair uh, challenge, actually. So, that, so the the. The policies, we make a distinction between proposals and policies. Policies are funded and we know we know how th those will be paid for it, where there is a cost. Not all policies, of course, carry a cost. Um, I, I suppose what we what we hope and expect from this is that the, 
the, what we are introducing is the idea of carbon budgeting properly into the future policy making process. This sets that element of the policy making process out, so it provides the framework, the carbon framework for future decisions, and then the budgetary decisions do need to follow that. So, I, I mean, my personal view is it's, it's, it is reasonable for us to set it out like that here, and for later spending reviews or budgets to then tackle the question of how one would fund those policies. But is it clear what the scale of ambition is? So, for example, this proposal in here to ha continue with a fund to enable people to take out loans to buy electric vehicles. Is that a million pounds or is it a hundred million pounds? So big difference in terms of the ambition and what uh, And again, achieved. entirely fair challenge. I think where, where we are clear on how a policy will work, we are very clear on then how, how much the cost would be of that policy. What you won't see, and, and, and I absolutely defend that, is, is a cost overall. Because actually what we are saying here, and this is I suppose the fundamental shift in the way that we view the policy making process henceforth, is that carbon budgeting becomes as fundamental as you know, financial budgeting. And therefore you will find the, co the, the, the funds for the entire climate change plan as it rolls out over the coming decades will be located in every portfolio. So effectively the, the cost of the, uh, tackling climate change is found in the money that we spend through Scottish Government policies throughout the piece. I think it might be helpful if, if, if I could just add um, a couple of words about two, two things in, in, in terms of scale of ambition. Um, what we've been very clear about in how we've constructed this document is the need for transparency. And you know, when, when a 170 page document lands on your desk and you've got a few days to, to read through it, it's, I can understand that it doesn't necessarily feel transparent. But what we've done here is we've, in each of the sectors, we have very clear policy outcomes. And where it's been possible to do this, we've actually attached a time profile in terms of numbers. So you'll see, you'll see in certain sectors, um, you know, transport is, 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 I think, is a reasonable example of this, that the policy outcomes are, are very are pretty clear and the time path is pretty clear as well. So that's, you know, if we are to hit the emissions envelopes which um, are in the plan, we need to hit those policy outcomes, that, those sort of time profiles. And that gives you, and it gives us, um, you know, a reality check on how well we're doing. Um, and the other element of that is the work that we've been doing on the monitoring framework. So you'll see that um, there's an articulation within the plan and, and a promise to develop this further, um, and also a commitment from 2018 to pr produce annual summaries of um, our monitoring framework, which will give, you know, it gives us a very clear indication about sort of where we're going, both in terms of those policy outcomes, but in terms of a number of other indicators, which are sort of our lower level indicators, which give you a sense that we're on track. And there are two examples in the plan um, of that monitoring framework that we hope to sort of roll out across the whole plan. There's an example from, um, I've taken from Pete, and there's an example taken from, from forestry. But that, I think, gives you, um, I hope, some reassurance that we're, we're keeping this transparent in terms of terms of ambition. Um, the other element of that is the, the budget summary that we, we publish annually alongside the budget, or just after the budget. Um, and I know that you, this committee and its predecessors have had some concerns about the tie-in between that summary and RPPP2. But obviously, from next year, um, when we produce that, we want to try and make that as tied into RPP3 as possible. So you'll start to see you know, the, the policy outcomes, the monitoring framework, and also the budget summary giving you that sort of information that will help you keep on top of progress and obviously help us keep on top of progress too. Um, Morris Golden. Um, I wonder if you could give us a specific example of where um, there is a detailed uh, policy or proposal in, in the climate change plan that perhaps will increase carbon emissions but will help to deliver other uh, priority areas for the Scottish Government, whether that be um, economic, uh, biodiversity or, or health benefits. I think one pretty good example is the way in which we treated the industrial sector. So this is the, the heavy emitters sector. Um, and the plan is, is very clear about our concern around carbon leakage. In other words, that if you, you come down too heavily on the industrial sector because you have, in essence, you know, manufacturing industry, um, then if you push too hard on that in terms of the carbon reduction um, you know, um, envelope, 
there's a danger and a real danger that those manufacturers will move, they will leave Scotland. And we've been very clear that the path that we're anticipating for the industrial sector needs to sort of be roughly in line with the rest of the EU and in particular the ETS. So we're not, so we, in a sense, we, we've constrained how we, we deal with the industrial sector so we don't go harder than the EU as a whole and therefore minimising the, the risk of carbon leakage or, or manufacturing leaving Scotland. So I think that's one very clear example in the plan of that sort of approach. Time, I think. Collins raised a very good suggestion for another um, area where we can demonstrate. So, so another example of that would be hydrogen. So we see potentially hydrogen coming forward as part of the solution to, to heat. Um, now, that the exact nature of hydrogen may change somewhere between now and the time it comes through, but it is something which certainly initially would result in emissions um, appearing in the industrial sector but avoiding emissions in the residential sector. And then as the process developed, you would see uh, carbon capture and storage fitting onto uh, the hydrogen manufacturer in a way that you can't fit carbon capture and storage onto domestic boilers. So you see that shuffling happening between sectors. We're going to move on to a section on policy assumptions, but let me kick that off by picking up on CCS, because Table 7.4 um, talks about the UK government involvement in this. Now, see, the UK government has effectively pulled the plug on carbon capture and storage. So I, I'm a bit concerned about the, the assumption there that they have a role to play in this. They will play a role in delivering the plan, given the position they've taken on that particular topic. You're right, say the UK government made a, they made a shift. So they, they pulled funding for a CCS competition that had, uh, I think the figure was a billion pounds um, uh, as a prize, effectively. I don't think that demonstrates um, a complete reversal of their position on CCS. So I'd, and indeed, if it did, we wouldn't be including it in this document as a, as a, as a credible policy. So it is my understanding that there is remaining interest around carbon capture and storage in, uh, at UK government level in, in Bayes, in the department. And our policy is to encourage that as much as possible and indeed for Scotland to be the location for any future investment around CCS or CCU, which is, I suppose, the other part of this carbon capture and use. The mystic view, does it not, given the, the, um, the, the, the kind of sounds that are coming out of Westminster around us? Um, I mean, I think it is an optimistic view, but then I suppose that's because I'm optimistic. So I, I, I think um, the, uh, the, the, it, it, uh, under all circumstances, CCS plays a very, very important um, system role. And Colin might want to say something about just how big the impact is. That we've done on that is the same modelling that my colleagues at UK government will have done, of course, around the whole of the UK systems. Getting at is what's plan B if the UK government doesn't step up to the mark on this? So we have run a model without carbon capture and storage for um, the power sector. Uh, the implication of that is that the system cost rises significantly. Um, it's about an extra three and a half billion onto the system cost. That's in line with what you see on these models being run on an international basis. So they've been run for the IPCC in the AR5 process, um, and they show carbon capture and storage as being very important going forward, not least because of the potential risk at a global level of an overshoot on uh, carbon dioxide, in which case the only option um, for bringing that back down is uh, biotechnologies with carbon capture and storage fitted. And you see that referenced in the, in the AR5 reports. Dave Stewart. Uh, you on the same theme, I'm interested in the assumptions that you have made in the plan. Clearly, in a simplistic way, any plans as good as the assumptions that you make, and obviously it has to be dynamic and responsive. And I think I quote from history, I think it was Napoleon said, any plan uh, falls apart with the first contact with the enemy. Um, so we a couple of examples. You make a big play, I think, about seven, the seven policy assumptions uh, around being a member of the EU. Now, clearly, that's a fast-moving situation, not least the Supreme Court, as we speak, discussing Article 50. You've made big assumptions about the EU, Clearly, that's going to change. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? And can the plan um, be adapted on the basis that we, once we cease to be members of the EU? There are, there are, th these are two excellent examples, actually, of, of underpinning assumptions for the plan that you see before you. And I'll stress, this is a draft plan. So that's the other part of this. So 
where, where, one, where are those assumptions to change, where there are changing circumstances, what we would have to do is amend the plan. I mean, it's a simple way of approaching it. So what we, what we know is that we are constrained by the overall carbon targets set out in the Climate Change Act. So what we must do is put in place a process that accommodates any future changes. And I suppose, going back to the first question that you asked at the beginning of this committee, I think that's what that, I'll accept clumsily worded, uh, uh, part of the foreword was about, actually, is that our ability to do that is greatly enhanced by the way we've approached this in the, in, in the third RPP. So we can now model a change in those things. It has knock-on implications, of course, if, um, if some of the assumptions that allow us to make the carbon assessments we're making here change. Um, and the way in which we approach this will, uh, will accommodate that in the future. What you see here is, as, to go back to John's point, as transparent as we can make it about how we've approached that and what the underpinning assumptions are, including our membership of the, um, uh, some of the EU uh, or Europe-wide institutions like the ETS. Okay, on a, a more positive point, um, you commissioned an extra document from Aether Consultants about uh, travel. And one of the very positive uh, issues they raised was the important role that active travel plays, um, breaking what I would call the sort of bunker mentality of departments. In other words, if you have active travel, you achieve a uh, modal shift. You also uh, improve the health of Scots, which is clearly something we all want to support, and got a very high appraisal in all the boxes that were ticked in that, in that particular assessment. Can you say a little bit more about um, active travel and the assumptions you've made on that is a very important vehicle for modal change and reducing our climate change emissions. Yes. Um, again, I think there's this recognition amongst um, the, the policy teams which are developing this about the importance of active travel. And there are a number of long-standing commitments that the government has towards active travel, including funding. Um, and those are very much factored in, 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 into the development of the plan. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that um, my policy colleagues in Transport Scotland recognise there are limits to, to how much modal shift you can, you can obtain through um, active transport. So whilst they're encouraging, there's also a recognition that some of the large transport emissions you know, can't be influenced by, this, by, by active travel. So it's important and it's factored in, um, but there's also a recognition that we have to do things elsewhere as well. Point, convener, um, is looking at, you obviously can't control the sort of parliamentarian policy issues that come along in terms of votes in Parliament. One issue that we've raised before in the Times model was sort of contradictory policy in climate change, which would be air passenger duty reduction. Um, clearly, that's going to increase emissions. Um, what thoughts have you had in these and your assumptions about how that's going to be rebalanced elsewhere um, uh, across the Scottish Government portfolio? So um, we're very mindful of the, the government's commitment and the government's policy around um, air, air departure tax, sorry, I think it's, it's now labelled. Um, and we, what we have done is we factored in those emissions into the development of the plan. Um, as I explained, I think, last year, at the end of last year, um, because of the way in which times works, it's, it's incredibly difficult to sort of, if not impossible, to tease out you know, the consequence of that particular change. But we have taken account of the increased scale of, of emissions um, from reducing APD, um, and they are factored into the plan. So it does take account of that. Although I couldn't point to the one exact policy, because it's impossible to do so, um, which is the consequence of that change. So it's going to have an, an effect. So in future... You, you mentioned this is just a draft plan. So in future assumptions, will that be uh, made as a concrete assumption in the plan? It was a concrete assumption in the current version of the plan, and it will continue to be so as long as that's government's policy. OK. Thank you, Kabir. On the issue of aviation, aviation and shipping, there's very little in the plan in specific detail around those relative to other sectors. Is that because of the international nature of those? Yes. Um, I, that's very much the case. I think, I think aviation is a good example. So. Scotland is you know, not the only, but, but reasonably unique in including um, international aviation emissions, for example, in its targets. And it's a very clear decision to do that because they are part of our carbon footprint, in a sense. But at the same time, there's a very clear um, recognition that the, the recent global agreement on reducing aviation emissions is, is, is the way to go. And you know, the Committee on Climate Change, for example, is, is also very clear that it's that sort of global approach which is, which is important. Um, obviously, um, 
so there is stuff in the plan um, around emissions from, from airports, um, and they are factored in, and similarly from sort of um, from ports. But those sort of, you, you're absolutely right, it's the, the international element of those, those areas which is where the sort of the policy wave will be taken. I question, uh, because I, I think the sector, the aviation sector in the UK has a target of reducing emissions by, I think it's 50% by 2050, while growing ca um, capacity by a similar uh, amount. Is that something that's factored in, in any way? There is a model. Th is, the, is the expectation that we'll see a 15% improvement in the efficiency of new aircraft? So yes, it is modelled, um, but it's that specific efficiency saving from, from the use of new aircraft. It's that, yeah, but there's nothing beyond that. I mean, there's a lot of stuff around biofuels, for example, or some other uh, stuff being worked upon. No. It's not in there? No. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Uh, just further to that, UK Climate Change Committee, one of their recommendations was that there should be an aviation strategy which is compliant with international civil aviation organisation agreements. I mean, do I take it that, that this is or isn't compliant with, with that? Probably a, a question that um, you needs to be directed towards the transport um, conversation. I, I, as you know, the... The, um, I should have sort of made this point much earlier in, in, in this conversation, um, that what we can offer you in a sense is a sort of um, an overview of the plan and how it sort of stitches together and answers some of your questions, but there are some things which I think are probably best left to the transport officials and the transport um, ministers who developed this work. So I think that's probably something which is better asked in that sort of forum. I mean, I would say, the, you know, the, the transport scenario, as with every other sector of the economy, has had a... a you know, an immense amount of consideration. So I would be surprised if we were proposing something that wasn't compatible with the, with the set of things you set out there. I just had a quick question, Kavina, about the European Emissions Trading Scheme as well. Um, I mean, obviously, as you know, we've heard already, there's some considerable uncertainty around that, um, whether even the UK is going to continue to be part of that scheme. What, what are the alternatives? I mean, does, does this model factor in there being an emissions trading scheme for heavy emitters either on a UK basis or possibly even on a Scotland-wide basis, depending on constitutional futures? I mean, what are the assumptions based on that? Is it possible to run an emissions trading scheme on a Scotland-wide basis or indeed I mean, a UK this basis? Is, um, this is a really important issue, of course, when we consider the implications of Brexit. Um, so in a second, I'll ask Colin to tell you exactly what is modelled in with regards to our expectations of the ETS. But in summary, we are expecting to remain part of it. Um, and you, the, que the, the question, could there be a replacement? Absolutely there could, but, but it would need to be designed and we would have to understand the impact of it before we could model it properly. But of course we would do that. So um, Colin, do you want to say just what's in the model when it comes to the ETS? So, so what we've done in terms of the ETS is we've treated it as two time periods. So there's a time period for which we have certainty, which is out to 2020. So out to 2020, we know what Scotland's share of the EU ETS cap is, and we know how we'll be adjusting our um, emissions to report against the, the targets. We know exactly what those, what those numbers are. Beyond the 2020 period, we don't know what Scotland's share will be of the targets. Now, the reason I differentiate between those two is that for the first, for the period out to 2020, that means in effect we run the model with two separate caps on it. So we force it to solve for emissions in the non-traded sector, and then we force it to live within the cap that we know is coming forward for Scottish emissions on the, on the traded sector. Now, when we go beyond the period to 2020, we don't know what Scotland's um, share of the emissions cap will be. So what we do is we take the model and we solve it with one emissions cap. So that forces us to take account of the relative, relatively the best place to share effort between what is currently the traded and non-traded cap. And the way I would characterise that is that's actually giving us an insight into the negotiating position we would want to take about our share of the traded sector cap to ensure that it's proportionate effort that falls on the traded sector and that's not disproportionate either to the traded or non-traded sectors. Okay. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, in relation to the EU and, and Brexit, could I ask, um, I'm, I'm reflecting back to the last committee in the RPP uh, uh, 2, and there was a lot of um, discussion and concern about um, the future 
technologies that hadn't yet been invented and the research opportunities that um, can be made in Scotland to, to develop those. I wonder if there's been any assessment in relation to Brexit uh, of um, the implications of possible loss of research collaborations or indeed of actual uh, funding that is coming uh, to us at the moment up to 2020. Uh, and that specific assessment in this area, although it is my plan to do so, we have though considered where there are interactions, of course, with the European in institutions and how um, should those, some of those institutions or rules or legislation not be there, we would have to, we would have to consider that. That's it, it, essentially what we've been doing is our homework. So um, once, we, once we are clearer on how some of those things will plan out, then I think you will see a, a clearer Scottish government position on some of those issues. At the moment, what we've done is mostly look at the body of European law we have considered, I know my colleagues elsewhere in the Scottish Government have considered the interaction with innovation funding and other European funding programmes. And there is a big interaction, of course, around energy and climate issues as well. Um, so we've begun that assessment, but we haven't written it into this document. That's something I expect to happen. Actually, once, we, once the team rolls off this, onto that will be the next task, I think, is the Brexit implications. Right, that's helpful, thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, moving on, we'll look at monitoring and evaluation. Um, Section 35 of the Climate Act requires that each new RPP should reflect upon the progress made around the proposals and policies in the, the preceding one. Yet this document seems to, to reflect a variation, certainly in the degree of detail that's provided. So take, for example, the electricity chapter, there's very little detail there set against some others. Uh, what lies behind that? I think this probably reflects the way in which the, the document has been written, that um, what we've tried to do is produce as much information as, as we can about progress. So you'll see that the chapters are structured in that way, which has got information um, on progress since RPP2. Um, and I think some sectors have you know, given us more information than, than others. So I don't think there's any deliberate thing behind it. And, I think certainly some useful feedback which we can take away is that point about the relative, um, you know, your, your sort of concerns that some sectors are, are not as well versed in the, those stories as others. So we can take that feedback and obviously as we develop the, the final plan, we can beef up those sections. We'll have that consistency across yep, the document. Okay, a reasonable point. Uh, moving forward, we obviously require a monitoring and evaluation framework to accompany the plan. Uh, where are we at with that? No, no. Um, we've spent a lot of time thinking about monitoring and evaluation. We've seconded um, Dr. Sam Gardner in front of WWF to help us for a number of months. And the work that Sam has been doing for us um, has been very much to think of what's needed in the monitoring framework, um, given his perspective as a, a, you know, an employee of an NGO. Um, so we, we, we have that sort of cross-check. And, and Sam has also got very much involved in the, in the policy work. So the, the work which has taken place in you know, take, taking the, the envelope as, as agreed by, by Cabinet and then working up the policies and proposals necessary to deliver that. So Sam has been very much involved in that process of thinking through how do you hit and what do you need to be able to demonstrate um, that you will hit those envelopes. And when I was talking earlier about the time profile of policy outcomes, um, you know, that's very much part of that process. So that we, we have the output of times, um, which gives us a, a, a real sense of sort of the, for example, the penetration that you need in electric vehicles. Um, just one very small example, but that's an important one. And we've taken that sort of information from times. We've sort of, um, sort of road tested that a little bit, excuse the pun. Um, and we have, in the plan, we've given those sort of policy outcome profiles. Um, some of them need a little bit more work for sure, um, but I think the, the bare bones of that are there. We also have developed a policy framework, which is explained um, in the plan. There's quite a useful um, picture in the plan, which sort of explains that. Um, and as we roll out the final plan um, in due course, um, we very much intend to give an update on what we are with that monitoring framework. And the final frame monitoring framework will be published in 2018, along with the first annual summary. So it's very much a work in progress. But we, what we've been, I think, very clear about is that it needed to be bedded into the policy development process. So hence Sam's role and the value that he's added to this project. 
Um, and also, um, we're very clear that you, know, you need information to, to evaluate where we're going on. Um, one of the things that I'm very keen to do is to have a conversation with the CCC. You'll remember in their last prog progress report, they were very clear that we needed um, smart indicators um, on progress. And one of the things that I would like to do now we've got you know, where we are, um, I would like to have that conversation with them so we can sort of marry our approaches as well. My understanding, Dr. Gardner's secondment ends in a couple of weeks' time. Is that right? Yes, because that's that. Um, obviously, WWF want him back, so they can um, help you in the scrutiny process and other other things. Um, so, Dr. Gardner's secondment does end. It has been extended a little bit um, to sort of take it to, to um, up to the publication point. Um, and what we will be doing is we'll be taking forward the work that Sam has started and the sort of framework that he's developed. Um, and you know, we'll do that as an internal piece of government work. But um, it's been enormously valuable having Sam with us because I think he's, he's brought a very clear sense of what we need to provide you and the NGOs with in order to monitor the framework. Interesting position. We'll be holding one of the NGOs to account for the climate plan. So, yeah. well, I think that's what joint working is all about. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but I want to develop this monitoring process issue because um, it, I think the plan indicates it will produce a capability to measure progress or otherwise in a, a variety of ways. So, so if we assume that it will function as it's predicted to do, how would you envisage encapsulating the detail for the, pro the process of scrutiny by this parliament and these parliamentary committees. I mean, for example, would there be an annual or biannual reporting mechanism um, so that parliament could consider whether progress has been made or not? And I mean, uh, perhaps on a, a less detailed level, um, one of the criticisms of RPP2 was that it was uh, long on uh, proposal, short on policies. Now, this document, you couldn't accuse it of being that. Nonetheless, there are a number of proposals that will develop into policies. So I'm interested to explore uh, the opportunity that will be for the committees of the parliament who have an interest in the, the plan going forward to have oversight of how the proposals have developed into policies and the more detailed items that I've mentioned previously. So the, the commitment in the plan is to have an annual summary monitoring report and to some extent, you know, the shape of that is a conversation that we can have over the course of the next you know, 12 months or so as we develop that, that framework. And you know, what you need is an important consideration, so I'd encourage us to have that conversation about your needs as well. But what I am personally very clear on is that there's a commitment in the plan to have that monitoring framework published every year from 2018. The CCC also produced their annual um, progress report, and I'm very pleased that over the past couple of years they produced that after the greenhouse gas stats have been published. Um, and I'm very keen, as I said a few moments ago, to have a conversation with them so that our, our scrutiny work, without eroding their independence, but we're offer, operating off a similar sort of set of indicators. So th I think there's an awful lot you know, going to be for you to allow you to do that. Um, I think for us, um, we need to be able to keep track on delivery. Um, that's important to um, our cabinet secretary as well. Um, and we, we will need to keep a cap, we'll need to keep an eye on exactly the, the issue you, you, you talk about, about the development of moving proposals into policies. That's one, one element of it, but only one element of it. I think the other really important element of this scrutiny process is the greenhouse gas invent inventory. Um, you know, it is published with a lag, which is why we're keen to have different sorts of indicators in the monitoring framework, which give us um, a more up-to-date feel of where things are going on, but it's an important part. And Colin and his team have been working very hard behind the scenes to improve the quality of that um, inventory as well. So there's, there's a lot of information there, which I'm very keen, um, and there's a commitment in the plan that we lay before you. But I would welcome that sort of conversation about what you need as well. If I could just add one bit to that, which is that it is very deliberately the, uh, the, the intention of this process that we plan an annual cycle of inquiry. So, and, uh, and um, without revealing too much about what um, Mr. Wheelhouse will say to Parliament later about the energy strategy, there is a similar process required and planned there too. So I would really appreciate the views of the committee on whether and how you would like those things to be aligned and indeed how we might plan the the, you know, the scrutiny with, with, with Parliament around that kind of calendar of the year, because I think that's a really valuable thing for all concerned. Okay. I, and, and just finally in this, this area, can I ask, the planned governance body that's been talked about, I mean, will there be a role for some of the NGOs in that to have oversight of, of uh, uh, delivery of the plan? I think that's 
thing that we need to, to reflect upon. Um, as you'll be aware, we used to have something called the Climate Change Delivery Board, which didn't have NGOs on, but it, it had um, Dr. James Curran, um, who was Chief Executive of SEPA, and then as an independent, it also had a COSLA representative, and it had Dr. Andy Kerr from Edinburgh University. So it had external members. Um, during the development of the plan, we operated a slightly different model, which was um, we got the senior civil servants together who were responsible for the different areas. So we have experience of both, and I think it, it's, it's an issue that we need to, to work through with the Cabinet Secretary about how she wants to do that. Um, and obviously, the, the other part of that is a sort of the, the, the process um, that Cabinet and the subcommittee takes as well. So I think the, 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 the blunt answer there is that we haven't worked that through yet, but um, I think we've got an awful lot of experience on which to base that sort of thinking. Thank you. Okay, moving on, uh, Jenny Goldruth. Good morning to the panel. Um, in terms of stakeholder involvement, um, it's clear that uh, a collaborative approach has been adopted um, with regard to the, the draft plan. Um, Page 27 of the report talks about half of the Scottish population seeing climate change as an immediate and urgent problem. And I understand that a series of climate conversations were held nationally uh, with members of the public to engage them uh, in this process more broadly. Um, I just wonder if you can point to specific examples of where that stakeholder engagement has affected uh, the draft plan itself. And secondly, I wonder if, as part of that engagement strategy, you specifically uh, focus at all upon how you engage with young people, which is actually something that the committee is going to be doing um, tonight uh, more broadly. And I suppose that kind of cuts into the next question, so apologies to Kate Forbes. But in terms of affecting um, behaviour shift, I think it's really important that you speak to the next generation. So I just wonder to what extent that stakeholder engagement has focused on young people um, at all, if it has. If I just if I say something briefly, I'll, I'll let you talk about the climate conversations. But um, there is a there is a the the the, in, the the one I'm most familiar with is around energy efficiency, where we've we've done a lot of work to discuss what sort of policy might work. Um, quite different, actually, to the way we might normally go about things. So you know, you might characterise the normal approach to the, of the civil service or the government to these things to sit in a room and plan something and then put some advice up and implement it. Actually, that just won't work when it comes to people's behaviours in their homes, how they interact with, for example, the energy market, why, for example, people don't do what economists like Colin might think are seemingly rational things to invest in their homes to make it warmer. Those conversations have been incredibly helpful in throwing light on how you might roll out an energy efficiency programme. And again, we'll put more detail around that later when we publish the energy strategy today, but that's one example of where those conversations have led to a change in the way we approach that. John, you might want to say something about the climate conversations more generally. The climate conversations more generally, um, these have been rolled out in a number of ways. We, we, we've encouraged um, stakeholders and other people with an interest to, to run these, and we have a toolkit for them doing that. And therefore, we have, um, when those happen, we have very little control over um, you know, who's involved in them. Um, we have spent a little bit of money um, actually recruiting panels um, to participate in those. So we actually pay people to participate in the climate conversations. And the, the numbers of people involved in that have been relatively small, um, although they have included young people. Um, and the, the numbers are small because of the, sort of the nature. It's like a focus group, and therefore you, know, you can get an awful lot from a relatively small number of conversations. So that demographic of young people have been included in that sense. The other elements in which way which young people have been involved in this process is to the 2050 group. Um, so the 2020 group some time ago set up um, a, a group of young people, um, people sort of in their 20s or so, um, <clears throat> who were interested in becoming sort of climate leaders of the future. And we, we have worked with them at various points to, on, on this, they were involved in the stakeholder event in December, for example. Um, so young people have been involved, but not, um, okay. Thanks. Okay. Can I ask in a more specific way um, to deliver on this to get significant buy-in from some sectors, probably all sectors? What direct conversations have been had with the likes of industry, or we've touched upon earlier, agriculture, and what is the vibe in terms of buy-in? Are some of them having to be dragged kicking and screaming to do this, or are they all universally right behind it, or somewhere in between? I think it's... The, the conversations have been... 
proceeding at different paces, I think, is, 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 yes. is the, the way of talking about this. So for, for some years, the government has had um, an involvement that with the 2020 group, which is a independent group of, of businesses who have a strong interest in, in climate issues. Um, and they have been an important industry voice, but that's a certain sort of self-selecting group of people who have an interest um, and often an in industrial interest in, in this area as well. Um, there's been, as Chris, I think, has, has, has pointed out, you know, when it comes to things like energy efficiency, there's been more involvement, um, particularly as the, the SEAT program covers both non-residential and residential um, buildings. Um, in agriculture, there's been a fairly intensive involvement of, of, of industry. One thing that I'm very pleased about is an opening up of conversations with the, with the standard business organisations. So the government has now started to speak to, to all the business organisations about the climate plan. And this is actually, I think, an enormously important development um, because previously we haven't had a great deal of success in those conversations. But I think now those conversations are starting and I'm very pleased that the, the business organisations are, are, are interested and, and willing to talk and we will one of the one of the sort of the key things that we will be doing over the next few months as we we we, we reflect internally on, on the climate plan is deepening those conversations with industry I, I guess and you've kind of answered this is, is is the question is how clear are these sectors on their uh, responsibilities, the understanding the role they have in us, but even allowing for the fact that they may get that they have a role to play, um, are they sufficiently well equipped um, to deliver on the targets or to assist us in delivering on these targets? Take that, John. I mean, so I, I think a legitimate criticism of the plan is is the is the extent to which each sector has been consulted in exactly the same way. So, so we so you can contrast, for example, the renewable sector which is one that we engage with very regularly, have a very clear understanding of their needs and how they will play a role in this system going forward with a very disparate sector like services. So there has been engagement all through this plan with all of the industrial sectors or um, commercial sectors in the economy. But the extent to which we've been able to do that it varies immensely according to you know, what the policy package is and, and indeed how much we, um, we have existing relationships with them. That's something I'm very keen that we do something about. So um, my my... My take on this plan is actually this should be a facilitator for some for the discussions with some of the sectors who've had less engagement. Uh, so, how much work remains to be done? Um, I think I mean I, I I accept quite a lot in some areas actually. I think the the um, I'm I'm thinking particularly of the services sector, which is of course our biggest sector and well one of our biggest sectors at least, and and is very 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 disparate. So I, the, we need to think about how best to facilitate the discussion with each subsector of services so that we can get into the discussion of how to get there. Okay, which I think probably moves us on to the whole issue of behavioural change. Um, Kate Forbes. Great, thanks very much. I just want to move on to um, the ISM approach, which the draft plan refers to, and the three contexts that influence people's behaviour, and there's a really helpful um, piece in the annex as well that covers that. But could you identify where in the plan development process behaviour change was considered and particularly, where was it reflected in the iterative process of developing the emission pathways and the policy outcomes through the Times process? Yeah. So, I think one of the sort of the key things for us in, in thinking through this plan was behaviour change. It's um, been important. We you know we have long recognised the importance of behaviour change within the government and the importance of getting people to do you know, the things which will help us in, in reducing carbon emissions. And the work on the ISM model um, has been going on for a very long time. What we did in this plan, which I think um, pushed this forward, was that we put quite a lot of resource about how you use that model. So we have the model developed, and we developed um, in conjunction with a number of external um, consultants, we, we developed toolkits for thinking about this. And, Crudely, how can you run a, a, um, a session for, for various different sorts of people using this ISM model, um, which will help in thinking about behaviour change and policy design? And we put um, a reasonable amount of money behind, behind this. We offered 
our colleagues um, in different parts of the government the opportunity to have these workshops and to have them both for policy makers within, within government and also externally. And we had, you know, we had pretty good take up. Um, energy efficiency is one which, which comes to mind. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty classic sort of issue that um, you invest in new systems, you um, invest in new heating systems, and um, individuals have difficulty in using them, um, or they use them in certain sorts of ways which you know, don't achieve what we want to do in, in terms of energy efficiency or carbon reduction. And you know, that was one of the areas in which the, the policy people sort of took this um, and they sort of ran with it. They ran a couple of these workshops, both internally and, with, with, and I think externally. Um, and you know, the ability to sort of change people's behavior was very much factored into the development of policies and proposals. And I think that's also very much reflected in the work that they're doing on, on, on SEAT, the, the Scottish Government's um, Energy Efficiency Program. So I think that's one pretty clear example. Um, there are, are pieces of work that are upcoming and then um, one which I know about is we have um, an intention to look at the school run um, in terms of transport and, and mode choices and you know, what we can do to influence behaviours around that as well. So I think there are two examples there, um, one which we've done and one which we intend to do. In terms of what you intend to do, that school run point is helpful, but what, what other plans, could you sketch out some other plans um, in terms of furthering the work of engaging on low carbon behaviours? Um, and increasing the pace of change after the publication of the plan? So, uh, for me, just taking a sort of step back on this, the, the, I think one of the, the, the really key messages of the ISM model um, is that this is not just about running workshops or sort of exhorting people to, you know, um, I don't know if you remember the very old ad from years ago, you know, throw away your, your, your car keys or something. It's not about that. It, it's not as simply just focusing on, on people is very much about making sure that you've got everything lined up so that you have the right sort of infrastructure in place and um, that you provide information and you 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 help people do that go on that change and also that you work with the sort of the social norms and I think for me and um, I see this in a very holistic way so for me the sort of the the work that, that needs to be done here is further refinement of the policies and proposals to make sure that we've got all those elements in place I don't think you can just sort of pull out behavior change like that and say it's about behavior change it's about the whole picture holistically and I think um, as we sort of do further work on the policies and proposals in, in all areas, I think that's going to come through. You know, we had um, an example this morning when we were talking about soil testing and farming. Um, we've talked about energy efficiency and, and, and you know, heating controls. But for me, it's, it's just across the whole piece. Active transport is another example of that. Mm. So in short, you would say that behaviour change and um, factoring that in has played a big part in the... It's made. It's, it's been a big part in in, in our consideration. Um, it's been a really big part in that sort of process. Once you have the envelopes of designing the policies and proposals underneath that, but you know this is not an issue of set, sitting on our laurels and saying that we've done it. And um, there's an awful lot more work that needs to be done. I think we have a really good framework and we have a really good toolkit, and we have now a reasonable amount of experience in, in, in running these workshops, both for policy developers, but also involving you know, the public or the, the people in, in the sector, and we need to do more of it. Okay, uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. Um, on page 30 of the plan, or the draft plan, um, the um, issues around the planning system are highlighted, and I wonder if uh, anyone on the panel today can uh, describe for us the um, interactions in relation to or conf um, the possibilities that you see um, in relation to the planning system and uh, especially in view of the fact that there's a planning review um, uh, which has just been launched recently by the Scottish Government and also how that relates to the national planning framework. So I might take this, Johnny, please step in if you want to, but um, it's particularly important when we think about the infrastructure challenge overall. So, I mean, the, we, we could actually try and distill out from this an, an infrastructure strategy, and that's something that perhaps we will come to when it comes to um, putting more flesh around some of these, these issues. But we, we, we are particularly aware of the importance of the planning region when it comes to the planning for future infrastructure, and particularly uh, transport and energy infrastructure, which are the kind of two key points for us. So we look to that planning review, which is underway at the moment, as being a very important point, and, the, and then the reframing of, in particular, the national planning framework and the SPP underneath that as being important moments in the future when 
planning is not a, I've learned from painful experience, not something you can change quickly. So actually, the, the, uh, the, um, it, it, I think it's immensely important that you get the strategic objectives right at the outset and let the planning regime reflect that. Um, and I think this puts us in that, that, that space. So as, as my colleagues, my planning colleagues in the Scottish Government um, plan for NPF4 and as part of the planning review, the things that we have set out here as strategic objectives for the whole economy will play a much bigger role, I hope, in the way that we, we view the planning regime. Thank you. That's very encouraging. Okay, thank you. I'll let Mark Ross go in here. Um, yeah, if I could just go back to the issue of stakeholder engagement and in particular the UK Climate Change Committee. Um, I mean, the committee came up with a number of recommendations last year, some of which have been taken on board and are fleshed out as policy objectives or whatever in, in RPP, but a number have been rejected. So what, what's what been the process of rejecting those and then discussing the reasons for rejection with the UKCC, justifying that, getting their advice on whether that's a wise move or not? So I think all this comes really, really down to the, the, the the different ways that we've tackled this, that the, the CCC um, have a modelling framework which is li rather like the RPP2 framework, and that's resulted in a number of recommendations. Um, and the TIMES framework um, is different, and we've talked at length about the characteristics of that time, TIMES framework, but it, 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 it basically suggests that um, the, you know, you can achieve things in a, in a more effective and at a lower societal cost by doing things differently. And what we have done is that we've worked very much with the Times approach. So it's not so much we've sort of um, you know, rejected in a very explicit sense some of the CCC recommendations. They've informed our thinking. Um, but the Times model throws up some very, very different approaches. And I think Colin has already talked about some of the issues, um, particularly in the residential and service sectors, where the, the, the Times modelling um, takes a, you know, a slightly more aggressive approach, perhaps, than the CCC modelling. And you know, there are flips in transport, I think, is, is probably one of them, where the CCC would push more and we would push less. Isn't that, isn't that challenging if your own advisors are operating a different modeling system to, to your own because uh, surely the assumptions will be different and there's a mismatch there I think it provides a very valuable double check um, there are other people um, and we have been talking to them as well um, who operate the times framework so there's there's um, a group at Edinburgh University who operate the the times framework um, in a slightly different context at, um, and different times models but um, I think that the fact that they're using a different modeling approach is, isn't, isn't an issue. I think it's, it's a strength that we have a variety of um, different approaches and it allows us to sort of cross-check um, what the, their advice against our advice um, or our modeling against their modeling. And I think that's, you know, going back to your point about sort of iteration, I think that's an important thing that we, we need to continue to do with them and deepen that conversation. I should add, though, that you know, we, we've kept the CCC pretty much in the loop on, on where we're going with times modelling and, and our general approach that um, when the analysts and Colin were, were building the times model and doing the data checking, um, we had some very, very helpful input from the chief analyst at the CCC. So they're, you know, they're, they know what we're doing and they know our approach and we, we, we just have a different approach to modelling. And they entirely accept, I, I mean, I can't speak for the CCC, but uh, um, my understanding is, anyway, is that they accept entirely the validity of the times approach. So it's there's just an alternative way of modelling it. It does throw out different, um, uh, you know, different conclusions, though, I accept. Have you run their policy recommendations through the Times model? So they, they are just they are just different ways of different ways of taking the approach. So what, what Times is doing, as we've discussed before, is looking at the at the whole system. What they're doing is looking at components within the system. So I suppose what you can usefully do is to compare those two approaches and look for areas of difference and look for areas of similarity and use that to cross-reference, as John has said. I mean, I think the thing we've been particularly careful to try and do during the modelling process is to view the model as, as a guide. So it's not, this isn't setting out in tablets of stone what the future will look like. This is setting out on the basis of our understanding of the best information we have available to ourselves just now 
what we think the future may look like and what we think the challenges may be in terms of getting to those pathways. So I think it's important to understand that there are a, there's not one truth, there are multiple aspects of that. And I think the, the kind of, no, not quite that. There are, I mean, I think that, so, so a good example of this, again, coming back to it, is our approach to having the, the separate evidence reviews around the benefits that aren't captured in the Times framework. So if you, if you look at the, the sort of bottom line Times number, they're not in there, but they are in the plan and they are in the consideration that's come around the package of the plan. Can I just press you on, on one particular recommendation which we touched on earlier? That's about compulsory soil testing rather than a policy where the government expects farmers to be uptaking soil testing by next year. Have you run those two different scenarios through the Times modelling? One where there's clearly a compulsion, a regulatory regime, the other one where there's a policy based on voluntarism? That. Um, what the Times model does is it provides you with the sort of the <clears throat> the least cost or the least cost modified envelope for the agricultural sector. So it takes account of the costs um, in the agricultural sector of reducing emissions to society. However, that's done, be it through compulsion, regulation, voluntarism, or, or whatever. Um, and it does the same for other areas as well. So it. it will take those things for transport and it will say, well, look, this is technologically what you can do. This is the, the best least cost technology that you should do, ditto in agriculture. And then the policy teams go away and they think, and they spend time, and this is where Sam Gardner was particularly important in this process, um, of saying, well, look, here, here we have an envelope that we have to hit. Here are the policy levers and proposals available to us. Which ones are best? Which one will hit? Which ones are our best? for us in delivery terms, which ones will work with the grain of stakeholders. So that's a process. So you can't, in a sense, run those two you know, compulsory soil testing versus voluntary soil testing through times. All that times will give you is that you need to, to get the application of nitrogen at a certain level. It's very much the sort of more traditional develop, approach to developing policies and proposals which sits underneath the times envelope. But let's leave times out of it for now and just pursue this line about UK CCC recommendations. One of the criticisms that's been made is about, uh, previously, is about failure to identify who has ownership of a policy. So what I want to tease out here is around this quite important issue. Um, will there be, as we move forward, people, bodies, because it's not just government who will have ownership of a policy, or are we to assume that the relevant minister or cabinet secretary ultimately has that ownership? So I think a really important question. I, I might not be able to give you an, a satisfactory answer to it because I'm not sure there is one. But um, the, what, the way that we've approached this is that we've made cabinet secretaries responsible for the policy making. So that, that's what you see laid out in the draft plan. I think there's a different discussion about who ultimately is responsible for, for, for the ownership of the delivery of that policy. And, and our intention in monitoring that is that we are much clearer and transparent about who's responsible for that in the future. So um, it, I think it will vary according to what the policy is. And indeed, some of these policies vest at EU and UK level as well. So there's a, there's a kind of question there about how, if, if at all, we can uh, oversee delivery in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a clear fashion. John Ireland. And if I could just add to what Chris has said, um, what we do in the plan is we're very clear about um, first of all, are those policies at the EU level, which we've talked about, ETS, the UK level, we've talked about CCS, or the, or the Scottish level. Um, so table 9.1, for example, on page 73 does this. It's very clear on the public sector partners. Table 9.1 is not a great example of that. Um, <laughs> it just says not applicable. But um, on page 76, for example, um, there's an example where local authorities are responsible for a po policy and proposal. So if you, you go through the policy chapters, Public sector partners are clearly identified, and there's also a very strong narrative on delivery route. So we have thought this through in the policy development, and we're trying to be pretty clear about it. So again, that's part of this approach to being much more, you know, taking on board the, the, the concerns around RPP2. What we've been trying to do here is being transparency about the delivery route um, and the public sector body, which is responsible. In governmental terms, Chris is absolutely right, the individual portfolio cabinet secretary has responsibility within cabinet for those policies and proposals. Okay, what's, sorry, Claudia Beamish. Sorry. Uh, 
what, then what happens if, say, um, local authorities, having been on the public sector um, forum before in, in the last parliament, what happens um, if a local authority doesn't deliver, say, on the policy you've got about um, dealing with taxis? What happens if they're the leader? That becomes a standard conversation between um, Transport Scotland in that, that, that case, um, our colleagues in, 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 in local government um, and the local, gov and local government, and we have been at pains to establish relationships with COSLA around, around some of these issues. Um, there's an ongoing conversation there. Um, but that just becomes you know, a standard part of government policy delivery. Um, you know, similar issues occur in, in education and elsewhere. Okay, let's move on and look at uh, Peatlands. Um, clearly, personally, I find the targets that have been laid down very welcome. Um, and if the 2017-18 draft budget line is the shape of things to come, if it's the shape of things to come, then there's considerable funding there to help deliver on those. But there are a number of practical questions that arise from that uh, policy. Um, it talks about providing grant funding to eligible land managers. I just wonder if, um, if you could define which land managers are eligible and ineligible. Uh, and I note from Table 6.1, and I realise this is probably only indicative, that you seem to be envisaging 10 plus projects a year failing to, to be awarded grants. So I'm just looking for a little bit of clarity, because I think out there, excited though people are by this policy announcement, they're looking for that kind of level of detail. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> well, that's all right. Um, but we will write to you. Um, okay. and um, so we will, we'll just make a note of that. And we'll, okay. We'll, we'll, well, it may be the same with my other questions, which would be around the issue about um, it the, the policy indicates that restoration will predominantly be aimed at large landscape scale projects rather than small fragmented ones. I can understand the logic of that, but I'm just look for an indication of what would constitute constitute large or small scale projects. And, and whether you'll be focusing on badly degraded bogs or the easier to repair ones or a mix of both, because that's a significant issue around the result that you get. And if we're still on the, the subject of what you're going to write back to us on, um, I, I'm interested in whether the funding that's been um, identified is purely for the purpose of physically restoring the peatlands. I ask that because there is an issue around that having restored peatlands, particularly on a significant scale in certain parts of the country, the Cairngorms National Park would be an example, you then face the cost of fencing in the bogs to protect them uh, from the ravages of deer. So it would be useful, if you want to write back to us on all of that, um, f to have that detail. I think we should write back rather than seek, <laughs> seek inspiration at this moment. <laughs> Happy to do that, but it, but it is an area that there is a lot of interest has been generated around, and people are asking those questions. So the, as much detail as we have, I think would be, uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, let's move on uh, to the subject of waste. Morris Golden. Uh, thank you, convener. I refer members to my register of interest with respect to Zero Waste Scotland. The waste sector is a success story in terms of climate change, yet other waste targets, such as the recycling rate target, have not been met. Um, how does the plan for the waste sector seek to deliver on related targets, whether in waste or other sectors? Um, briefing I've had from my colleagues in waste and see if that actually gives you a helpful answer to that question. Um, I, I, my sense is that um, what I have in front of me is, is very much that um, we're going to continue to work towards our ambitious, um, towards a suite of ambitious targets, um, including, I think, you know, some of the things that you've mentioned of reducing waste by 15% by 2025 and increased recycling, 70% of all waste by 2025, um, that we're going to be building on our waste regulations, which keep food waste out of landfill um, by reducing the amount of food wasted in the first place and through action to meet our 33% food waste target. Um, 
So I think those are the sort of the, the key points on that, but um, I recognise that that's not a full answer to, to, to what you've asked, the question you've asked. So there could be potential conflicts there in terms of uh, synergies between the, the draft climate change plan and other uh, recycling or, or I, waste I, targets? No, I don't, I don't think that's, that's the case. I think okay. um, our colleagues in waste have, have worked, you know, they're, aware, they're aware of their existing targets and I think they'll have taken that on board. So um, I don't think there'll be that sort of thing. Colin, may I? Okay. So, I mean, one of the issues we faced early on in the, in the process was that our modelling potentially identified waste as a potential source of energy, but our colleagues in waste were very quick to point out to us the existing policy framework around waste, so we didn't um, undercut that agenda. So how, in terms of your assumptions on that specific point, how does energy from waste fit in with the assumptions you have made for the waste sector going forward? So we were, we were guided by, by our colleagues from waste about what we put in in terms of diverting waste streams into the, into the modelling. Um, the alternative is waste can look, as, look very attractive to these models as, as a source of energy. Um, but obviously, when you're starting to develop um, more positive uses for some of these waste streams around, for example, uh, the recycling, the whole um, reuse um, agenda, you don't want to be um, cutting off that source of raw material. So the information that was fed into the model took account of those policies. Confident there won't be a, a conflict, for example, between um, energy from waste and the, the contractual commitments that local authority have, have made to burn waste and the target set by the Scottish Government to recycle the same waste at a level of 70% by 2025? That's a, that's a level of detail beyond which we were, we're going in the modelling. We're looking at this in a sort of high level, sort of strategic, strategic view. And you know, we're taking the policy that, that waste are giving us going forward and implementing that into the modelling framework. So we won't, we won't be breaking any contracts. Those assumptions as energy from waste um, staying the same in Scotland, uh, increasing or, or decreasing uh, within the assumptions for this draft plan? I don't have the energy from waste assumptions in, in front of me, I'm okay. afraid I can certainly add those to the list of things we're writing out with. Okay, Sorry. thanks. And is there any conflict potentially between the food waste reduction target um, of 33% and the um, uh, uh, bio uh, refinery roadmap? Because potentially there's, there's feedstocks there that could be very interesting in terms of uh, processing and a, a reduction of those self same feedstocks. I think there is a conflict, uh, although I can see why you asked that question. But what, I, what, I, what, what we are able to do is to understand how the energy system would cope with that. So, so that's what Times is very good at. Now, whether it can go down to that level of detail, I'm afraid I'm not sure. But what we therefore take from uh, the, uh, my colleagues in the policy team that look at waste and indeed the ministers responsible um, is, is, is a set of assumptions that allow Colin to do the modelling work. So, so I am confident that in the future we could model, for example, different, different approaches to those things. And bioenergy is, of course, something that's very, um, uh, well, it's, it's quite underdeveloped as a topic at the moment. So that's something I expect would develop in the future, a position and that would change, I'm sure. The, sorry. Uh, the Committee uh, on Climate Change has recommended encouraging recycling and separate food waste collections in rural and island communities. What solutions is the Scottish Government considering and what leadership will be provided to local authorities in those areas who may not have the expertise of major waste collection service changes or commissioning new waste processing plants? I think the, the best thing is we write to you with that question, the answer to that question. Yeah. Yeah, I've got can can I just more. pick up on this issue about local authorities? Because Table 12.1 talks very clearly about local authorities being partners in delivery. But local authorities face other challenges um, you take, uh, that, that may conflict with what we're trying to achieve in this area. So, for example, if you take Angus Council, top performing recycling authority um, in Scotland, but because of budgetary uh, pressures, it has decided to close some recycling centres, reduce the hours of others, and it's currently um, withdrawing 
access to food waste collection in rural areas on the borders of settlements and villages. So what, work, what consideration has been given to the fact that local authorities as partners may have um, other pressures uh, coming to bear that may take them in a different direction to the one we, we want to go on with us? So I, I think the, the, at, the, at the top level, the idea of partnership with local authorities is a thing that this is built, built on. And, and you know, along the, uh, there are various degrees of partnership, I suppose. There's, there's, um, uh, and, and the policies that you laid out here are, are at that kind of level. I feel very strongly, actually, that we need um, a, a multiplicity of approaches right across Scotland. I think perhaps 32 would be too many, but... but at the moment, we have a plan that is very macro, if I can put it that way. And um, I, I think the next stage, one of the most exciting things to think about how we manage this and indeed the energy work that we'll do after the, after the current period of setting strategies is, is to understand in much more detail what local plans for those things are and indeed for the Scottish Government to support those local plans. So when I think of partnership, it's that really. So I, I would like to assist with the process of planning for a more bespoke um, energy and climate plan I think that stops short of a different carbon budget for each locale of Scotland. Um, you'd be free to suggest that, of course, but uh, I can see that would be a very difficult thing to implement. But I, I do feel that, we, that something very useful for us would be to, be to be in partnership with local authorities to better understand what the plan is in that area, partly as a means for public funding to flow, but also because it acts as a prospectus for private investment when you, get, when you do that properly. So that's something I'm very keen that we should do after this. Local authority clusters might be part. Absolutely. Of that. So I do. I do feel that 32 of those plans is, is probably too many. Um, uh, I'm happy to be challenged on that. But we certainly should have regional plans, uh, and as best we can can put those together. And that does require quite deep partnership working. And I think this sets the framework for that. Is the best way I can I can describe it. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia uh, Beeman. Sorry, uh, Morris Golden, if you want to come in there. Uh, do you have a point on that? No. No. Uh, just thinking about the, the kind of macro level uh, policies again, what consideration has been given, given to potential policies around deposit return or introducing greater uh, producer responsibility within, um, uh, within the draft plan? So again, that's, I'm not an expert in waste unless any of my colleagues know the answer to that question. That's what we'll add that to the list. So apologies okay. that I don't have that detail. Finally, oh, sorry. Morris Golden, not finally. <laughs> One more. Um, just thinking about jobs this time. And uh, obviously the evidence review makes clear that there's a lack of recent data and certainly Scottish specific data. I just wondered if you felt, felt that this was a concern and whether there was a plan to commission any studies uh, around this. Um, I don't think it's a concern, but I do see it as an area for further research. So I think, I think indeed, all of the stats I'm aware of around job numbers, for example, in the low carbon economy, are highly speculative. So although there are, I think some of them now are national stats, the, um, the, some of the methodologies for bringing those things together are, are, you know, constantly reviewed. So I do think there's an area there that we could do more on. Colin, do you want to say anything about how we might approach that? I mean, certainly at the moment, the, the, the challenge has been from the, the main sort of macro level data sets that everything is done on the basis of standard industrial classification. And that tends to be a fairly blunt tool, particularly as the sort of tentacles of the, of the low carbon economy start to reach out into traditional sectors, it becomes much more tricky to actually split out which jobs are or are not low carbon in, in nature. With what we've tended to fall back on on that is bespoke surveys, but those bespoke surveys are obviously expensive and we have to run them at quite a large scale in order to get any kind of level of statistical robustness. So that's why the UNS have brought forward the measures they have. I think it would be helpful if you were looking at this going forward to not just look at the total numbers of yeah. jobs, but mm -hmm. the types of jobs where they would be located. And I'm aware that uh, RAP in England has published uh, wider than the waste sector, but a, a circular economy uh, report looking at both uh, the total number of jobs, where they're likely to be presented, how that uh, reflects on unemployment in some of our most uh, deprived areas in England. And I think it would be useful to publish any uh, reports that you may have on that and also look at a more detailed study into that. So let me say now I agree with that. So I think you know there's always a tendency for us to alight on a single figure for job numbers in, in something like something as disparate as a low carbon economy. I, I don't think that's particularly illustrative of what's happening here. I think that the, the major reason why I would like to do what you've suggested is I think it, it really steers future policy development. So we would have a much stronger sense of where the really high value jobs lie in tackling climate change. 
if we can get underneath the skin of, 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 the, of, the, of the national position. Great, thanks. That's me done. Honestly. Thank you. <laughs> and in doing that, what's to account of the jobs that will be created by people in restoration? Because there will be jobs yep. around that as well Absolutely. in the rural areas. Thank you. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Right, thank you, convener. Uh, could I turn our, our thoughts um, uh, to uh, blue carbon and marine issues in relation to climate change? Uh, as you'll know, in the last um, session of the Parliament, I took a keen interest in those issues, as did, as did Paul Wheelhouse, who was then the climate change minister. Um, and there was in the RPP 2 on page 225, just for the reference, um, what I would describe as a box on blue carbon, rather like there was a, a box on um, uh, peatlands in the, in the RPP1 which flowed into where we are now with the carbon, low carbon uh, issues that are highlighted in this draft plan on peatlands. But uh, frankly, very disappointingly for me and a number of others, I see, unless I've missed it, I don't see um, uh, blue carbon in there as a development. And if I can just quote very quickly, it says on that page, Scottish Government is working with Scottish Natural Heritage to continue to develop our understanding of blue carbon. A, increase understanding and B, um, to review and develop policies on blue carbon and consider proposals to capture their potential. And most importantly, um, it says it is hoped that this will allow us to build a foundation which may, it may be possible to develop, um, from which it may be possible to develop policies and proposals for inclusion in the next RPP, which is RPP3, um, or the um, Climate Change Plan, in order to contribute to the efforts necessary to meet Scotland's annual greenhouse uh, emission reduction targets. Um, I think there's an absence, and I'd like to know uh, if you can shed any light on how that's happened, and whether indeed at this stage it might be remedied. Because I know through questioning, sorry, but in the, in the last session, through the questioning that happened, in part, and also representations from NGOs, I think that's why the box went in. It wasn't there at the start of the, the previous plan. So. I am very disappointed, frankly, you know, and I'd like to have any comment. Yes. Um, certainly blue carbon was something um, that we were aware that this, the predecessor to this committee was very interested in, and I remember uh, a conversation with Mr. Day's predecessor um, very much about that and his, his hopes, which I think are yours, um, Spimish, um, about the potential for blue carbon. So that's something that we, we have been speaking with our colleagues in, in Marine Scotland around. And my understanding um, is that the advance of both science here um, and also some of the monitoring frameworks has been much less rapid than it has been in the corresponding area of peat. So I think we've been making enormous progress with, with peat, um, which is reflected in both RPP2 and RPP3, the climate change plan. Um, and that has been on, on, on part on the back of some of the, sort of the, the monitoring and, and, and our scientific understanding. And as I say, my understanding is that, that things just didn't develop as rapidly in both monitoring, although Colin might be able to add to that in terms of IPCC and, and the, sort of the, the accounting framework, nor in terms of our sort of scientific understanding of, sort of the, some of the measures which, which may be potential here. Um, so that, that explains its absence. It was something that we, we did consider um, and pushed quite hard at in the, the early stages of the development of the plan. Um, but the message I've been having back from Marine Scotland was that we're just not as far forward because of both science and, and, and accounting frameworks on this one. Well, I, I mean, I think we have to accept that, that you know, this is a, an area where we require further work. So, I mean, I, and, um, uh, I'll reflect on that after this. So, so um, I, I think maybe the other thing to say is that, of course, this is partly the process I hope we are now engaging in. So, I, so I'm pleased, actually, although that might sound sound odd. I think the scrutiny process should throw out things where we require to do to do more and to look further. So, it, it sounds like one of those areas. Uh, in view of the fact that there was um, uh, what Mr. Wheelhouse and, and I described as this box that referred to the possibilities for the future in RPP2, that we should at least not lose it altogether. And uh, I would yes. be keen let's, let's to look see again at that. what sorts of research you know put into the yeah. um, the final plan, what sort of research there has been, because I know there has been some on sea kelp and a whole yeah. range of other 
areas. So, so it seems to me, at the very least, um, that's something we should be able to update you on. So, so um, take that entirely. Right, thank you. OK, thank you. Um, there are obviously a number of items you've taken away today um, uh, to, to write back to us on. I do appreciate how incredibly busy you are at the moment. Um, but if we could get answers as quickly as it's possible to do that, that would be great. Um, the committee clerks will be in touch with you to, with some reminders of some of these points. Uh, can I thank all of you today for your uh, attendance and your uh, useful evidence? Um, we'll now suspend for five minutes for a comfort break and resume.
Uh, welcome uh, back to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Um, we move to Agenda Item 3, uh, which is to take evidence from Scottish Natural Heritage on its report on deer management in Scotland. We have been joined this morning by Andrew Bachel, Director of Policy and Advice, Donald Fraser, the Operations Manager for Deer and Wildlife, Claudia Rouse, Head of Rural Resources Unit, and Des Thompson, the Principal Advisor for Biodiversity at SNH. Good morning, everyone. Um, Mr Bachel, I think you will give us a short statement to begin with. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, I, I, I hope it is reasonably short. But I'd first like to say thank you very much indeed uh, for inviting SNH to come back uh, to provide you with further information and to respond to some of the other submissions that you've heard. Uh, having listened to a range of the responses to the SNH review of deer management, uh, we've no doubt that there are many questions that you may wish to raise with us. Uh, we are pleased that the report has stimulated considerable interest and has widened the focus from just red deer in the uplands to all species of deer throughout Scotland. Deer are a huge asset, uh, a vital part of the natural heritage and, and our ecology, as well as a valuable economic resource, um, contributing to tourism, food, culture and jobs. And that's an important context for our work. We don't think that anybody has disagreed with our overall conclusion that deer are having an adverse impact on the natural heritage. Uh, we are more than content with the conclusions of the report and those findings, as they were based on the best available evidence and robust analysis and scrutiny of that analysis. The evidence has been drawn from a number of sources, and we would never claim that the evidence base was perfect, but we don't think there are any fundamental gaps or errors in what we presented, and we see no reason to redraw the conclusions, and, and we can explain that. Um, you have heard some views to the contrary, which we will pick up on. The five pieces of evidence uh, that we have relied on are the James Hutton Institute work on populations trends data, the Native Woodland Survey, the site condition monitoring data, Section 7 analysis, and lastly, but certainly not least, the assessment of the performance of the deer management groups since 2013. Uh, there have been some generic and some specific comments on, on that. I'll address some of the generic ones to start with. Uh, there was a question about the timing of the review. Uh, given that more information was due to be delivered to us in 2017, um, a question about whether we should have deferred uh, publication. But that would have been out with the Commission timetable that the previous Minister had set, uh, and in our view would not have added greatly uh, to the findings. But nevertheless, we will continue to review information that comes to us um, and take that into account o over the following uh, months. One thing we were not asked to do, in fact, we were specifically asked not to do, was to produce recommendations. Um, but I'm clear that it might be helpful to consider options, and, and certainly we would be happy to explore next steps, not at the stage as recommendations, but in order to carry the debate forward that's now been started. Uh, we're conscious that it's not necessarily around the issue of evidence, though, that more needs to be done to resolve the conflicting demands for deer management. It is vital that we make use of the various policy statements and documents and guidance that exists in order to del deliver action on the ground, but more than anything, perhaps we need clear, settled priorities uh, to bring that into account. Uh, I would argue that that's the most important uh, piece of work that now needs to be done. Uh, there's also been a question about the experience of SNH in, that we have brought to this work. Um, SNH is, has a lot of experience as a deer manager. We own and manage a number of significant estates where deer are a major component of the wildlife. We have staff with practical experience of deer management uh, who also provide advice to others and have been integral in preparing some of the documents like the Wild Deer a National Approach and so forth. We have a very strong science base with experienced wildlife managers and others able to address complex ecological and data issues. Our review involved people from all of these backgrounds, and several of them, uh, thankfully, are here with me today. But we didn't do this work alone. Our con the conclusions are ours, and we stand by them. But we have been greatly assisted by others in this process. Uh, and in that regard, I would like to put on record our particular thanks to the Association of Deer Management Groups uh, and to Richard Cook, uh, without whom we would not have got a lot of the data that we have required to have for this work. So uh, our thanks to them. I would also like to make it clear that the report is not universally critical. There is a wealth of good practical uh, 
experience out there on which future arrangements might be based. There are examples of attempts to deliver on the public interest objectives by managers of private land. What we didn't find was a consistent standard or a consistent evidence of progress. I suspect I've taken up enough time just on an introduction there. I would like to ask uh, Claudia Rouse, though, just to pick up on a couple of the other specific areas where criticism has been levelled at SNH. OK, um, thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Um, there were quite a few different comments um, circulating about our review, and it, it, I'm not going to go through them all, but there were two, you'll be, yes, pleased to hear, there, there were two main areas that I think that really referred to the evidence um, and that I would like to clarify for you. The first was in relation to the trends and population where we received the most substantial amounts of uh, supplementary evidence and um, criticisms and questions about the James Hutton Institute work. I wasn't proposing to clarify further because I actually felt that Professor Alban's uh, oral evidence last week and the uh, supplementary submission from the James Hutton addressed fully the issues that had been raised. What they did confirm, um, to summarise, is that the robust um, the trends that we showed over the last 50 years are absolutely robust and that the questions about the changes in methodology between, um, don't um, bear scrutiny. Um, and the other, the other issue about the difference in the modelling scenario compared to the practical counts also was with standard um, uh, tolerance of about 10 or 20 per cent. So it also uh, was uh, upheld the evidence. Um, moving on, I wanted just to touch on the other main area that seems to have attracted additional um, analysis and some misunderstandings, I think, about how the data has been interpreted, which, as we discussed last time, is complex and difficult, and that's in relation to the Native Woodlands Survey. There have been a couple of specific issues, which they're not new to us because the survey was published in 2014. So they have been quite well rehearsed, these positions. Um, and mainly, I've um, spoken to the Forestry Commission who commissioned the work, um, and their view is that it is about misunderstandings about how you interpret this complex set of data. There were two issues that I've picked up mainly, but I'm happy to answer any other um, queries you may have uh, about uh, the interpretations of the data. Um, one was, um, well, there is no dispute that deer are impacting native woodlands and that the headline figure that over 30% of native woodlands are impacted by herbivores. Um, but there was some new analysis done that used a different data set which then said that the Native Woodland Survey had incorrectly identified deer as the major driver. What, we, what, they, what this additional interpretation said it was that it identified that non-native trees, such as rhododendron, are a greater threat um, and impacting on native woodlands. It, what, what that doesn't do, it's interesting new analysis, but because it used different data set, it doesn't apply and isn't relevant to the findings of the Native Woodland Survey, and it doesn't counteract the main finding that 30% of um, native woodlands are impacted by herbivores. The one other factor, if I can, and then I'm just finishing on, on native woodlands, um, was the uh, allegation that surveyors um, were uh, um, had a tendency to overestimate the recording of deer as being present, and that is actually incorrect in terms of the guidance that was given to surveyors. Um, surveyors were asked to do two things for the Native Woodland Survey. One was to identify the impacts, which I've discussed is the 30% figure, and the other thing was to say, can you identify which herbivores are present? they could only identify 77% of cases where herbivores were present, and in 23% of cases, they couldn't identify which herbivore, and none was recorded. For the record, as it shows in our um, review, in 73% of cases, they did identify deer, and that is a correct figure. And supplementary information, which is provided in the full Native Woodland Survey, but I don't think we went into the detail in our report, 15% um, of cases, they identified livestock, and in 3.5% of cases, rabbits. 
and hairs. So it shows that um, it was incorrect to say that uh, the guidance on surveyors. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Uh, let's move on. Uh, David Stewart. Good morning, uh, panel. I've got a few technical questions about the SNH report on deer management. Uh, the first issue was, what was the procedure for selecting external peer reviewers of your report? Um, Des, I think maybe you could pick that up on the science committee. We um, have a scientific advisory committee, um, which is composed of a variety of experts. And for this particular report, we chose one member, Professor Robin Pakeman, to go through in detail the annexes. And we had Professor Colin Adams at Glasgow University uh, asked to peer review the report. Colin was a former member of <coughs> our Science Advisory Committee and indeed on occasions chaired our Scientific Advisory Committee meeting. So he's a very uh, experienced reviewer. Um, he didn't have a lot of time to review the report, but he returned the report with substantive, substantial comments, which we then addressed. Sure. So the, the external reviews were effectively part of your scientific community that you have in SNH. Was there any external advertising to invite people to be external reviewers? Was it advertised? No, this is why we have a scientific advisory committee. Um, it's quite standard to use members of a scientific advisory committee and members of our ad expert advisory panel to review reports for us. And normally we'd have one or two reviewers carrying out oh. that assessment. You would have picked up our evidence from Professor Alban, I think, last time round, when he suggested one way forward was to make the report a so-called beta version, uh, which is the horrible jargon, I think, from computer software, where you ask for external uh, consultants to review a piece of software before you fully launch it in the market and it could be applied obviously to any scientific piece of work. Is that something that you would consider useful in terms and um, of its viability with uh, the industry generally? No disrespect to your scientists who reviewed it, but in the sense that they would be seen as independent and external. Because my understanding of most academic work is getting external uh, validation from peers is very, very important in the academic community. Yes, yes. Presumably it's important in your community as well. Y yes, it is. And in fact, I, I am an associate editor of Journal of Applied Ecology, so I have to deal with this all the time in terms of getting reviewers. I think what, what we've done for our dear review is, is, is perfectly fine in terms of how we've published uh, other reviews. Indeed, for some reviews such as these, we might not have gone out to external review. However, I can say for the report that we received from the James Hutton Institute, we will be carrying out a more detailed review because there's so much more science in that report. So that maybe touches the point made earlier by Andrew in the sense that the previous minister had suggested certain timescales and that there was no recommendations. Obviously, you've had a lot more information then. So it's a possible you could have a phase two report which incorporates this new research? I don't think that's necessary and given the, the comments we've received in the report, we don't see any need for that. It's mm. clearly very important that when we get the James Hutton report, and we're obviously looking forward mm. to receiving that given the excellent yeah. evidence that Professor Alban gave last week, that it will go through a detailed review process. did pick up, I mean obviously the role of the committee is not to be the government, we're there to keep mm. government in check and we're there to give advice as well to organisations like yourself that are responsible to government. Clearly, I mean we're not scientists, but clearly there was criticism of the report. One very practical suggestion was um, if you had more external reviews and then had a stage two report, your report would be a lot more credible and obviously it's in our interest to see the reports more credible. You may have had one uh, tram line that you started on, we're suggesting another tram line. Can I just add maybe to uh, Desi's comments? I mean, as I think Andrew picked up, the five key pieces of evidence um, still stand in our view. The James Hutton will be um, subject to external peer review. The Native Woodland Survey is previously published and um, so doesn't warrant any further uh, peer review. The Deer Management Group uh, assessment, which is, forms a significant part of new data, there have been no disagreements about that, and um, th th that has been collected in partnership with the Deer Management Groups. And the two other areas, which are using our own data on site condition monitoring and the use of Section 7s, are quite small. Certainly the Section 7s is a very small data set with 11 agreements. Um, so I don't it's the, the, the data sets 
um, some of them are not subject to further peer review. I think, the, the, for me, the main challenge has been in terms of how we then reached our conclusion um, based on the evaluation of those data sets rather than it being meriting any further peer review. Whilst I can accept that, there's obviously scientists that give us this advice at the last advice session. Um, basically, if you have nothing to fear with your, with your report, what have you to fear with having further external uh, assessments? Because clearly, you know, the scientists, I'm sure, are first class who looked at it were effectively internal because they were part of your scientific advisory committee. That's quite normal in terms of peer review. It's often extremely difficult to find referees mm -hmm. who we don't know. I should also add, of course, that as we were producing the report, we had a small group of scientists actually advising um, on a number of the chapters. We had a dear science group uh, with three individuals, a group that was chaired by Andrew uh, on occasion. So actually, as we went through the process of preparing the report, we were very careful to make sure that we had scrutiny of the science. But I must emphasize that once we get the report from the James Hutton Institute, we will be carrying out a detailed review. As for the record, I'm not obviously criticizing the scientists, I'm sure first class who were advising you. I'm merely making the point I mean, if you don't advertise, it's very hard to know what's out there. Um, since there has been some criticism, a, a suggestion certainly uh, came from witness last week, is that you do look again at this. So my suggestion would be, why don't you look at advertising in some specific areas where you think it's useful, see if you can get someone who's not attached to SNH to give another view on this. I think that would help with the credibility of the report. The review ultimately, and I'm not sure if Andrew wants to come in here as well, represented the view of SNH. And we knew that that's what it was going. We were asked for our view and we gave our view. And I think that is mainly where the disagreements have been, not on the underlying interpretation, which, as I've said, most, uh, most of the uh, interpretation of the data is around misunderstandings. So I don't think it would be appropriate to ask for a peer review of something that represents the view of SNH's board. But I'm happy to draw or explain further how we reached that view, because running through the thread of each of the five key evidences are about the impact on their natural heritage, and there is nothing anyone has said that disputes that. This particular topic in a good deal of detail. Um, moving on, uh, Kate Forbes. Thank you. So we've already touched briefly on, on the data sets, but there have been some comments that the interpretations are not reflective of the evidence. So what, what would be your response to accusations um, that the report is biased? Uh, <clears throat> I'll pick up the general question there and, and let, let Claudia pick up some of the detail. Um, we have brought to this process people uh, within the organisation, uh, an economist, uh, plant ecologists, people who experience in deer, a whole raft of skills that we have uh, at our disposal. And they've all had a role in uh, undertaking the, the, the review and, and in monitoring how the work was done. Um, as Des has already said, uh, we've had the external review and, and one issue I might add on that is our, our, the scientists that we've picked for that are all obviously picked through a public appointments process uh, to get onto the, the advisory panel in the first place. So there, there is that uh, level of um, external advertising that which we didn't refer to. Um, I think it's important that we've brought all of those skills together in the team that was responsible for, for bringing the report together. Um, inevitably, um, we will make judgments based on the principal functions of SNH, which is uh, as the ad advisor to government on the natural heritage. Uh, so it would be expected of us, I think, to cover that in more detail than to cover some of the other areas in which we're not as expert. Uh, and so if there is, if there is a, a slant in the report towards that and not towards other things, that reflected the brief that we were given, and it obviously it reflects the, the nature of the organisation that we are. We would not claim uh, to be experts in these other areas, and I hope we haven't then therefore tried to draw conclusions that would be unreasonable. But, Claudia. Yes, sorry, I <coughs> thought um, what you were going to go on to say in us um, having um, some perceived bias is um, what some commentators have picked up is that um, the analysis that flows through the review was not then reflected in the conclusions and that we seem to note many successes in um, the analysis and then drew more negative conclusions. Um, and actually what I think that reflects is that we were absolutely as open, rather like uh, the group you have here on the committee, we had an editorial panel which consisted of people who work very, very closely in deer management in SNH, 
um, coupled with others such as myself who've come in with more analytical and robust and a bit more distance from the industry to set out some scrutiny and challenge. And that is reflected in our management team and in our board. But in terms of the flow, we, we related the many successes because we are really determined that this review wasn't seen as a critique of the industry. What we have found when you look at the actual analysis, particularly of the DMGs, there are many, many successes and many people are doing the right thing. And we wanted to reflect those. But we did have to look at the terms of reference, um, which is where our conclusions come from, which was what was the impact on the natural heritage specifically? And that thread runs through the, deer, the increasing deer trends, the native woodland, Section 7's site condition monitoring and the DMG assessment. Just so to interrupt, heck, yeah. apologies for interrupting Kate Forbes as well, but this is a really important point because, as I recall, one of the accusations that was made was that you put this report together, you didn't talk to the people in your organisation or run it by them. So I guess, just to be absolutely clear, have people like Mr Fraser, with expertise at the coalface, as it were, did they have sight of this report and any input into it before it was made public? Uh, yes, but I think Donald <laughs> answer this. Yes, Inevitably, um, we, were, we were involved very much in terms of the data gathering side of it and get, getting the data the data for the report, uh, we're involved in some of the drafting of the report uh, and uh, seen sight of the report at the end of the day. But obviously there's a process to go through there in terms of editorial process, uh, the, our management team looking at it and the board sign off for it. Um, so obviously the, the report went through the, the whole gambit of the, the people who are involved in the organisation. Can, can I just add that for the record, um, other colleagues other co colleagues, um, um, including our ex-DCS staff, of which Donald is one of them, uh, are represented on our management team and on our board, and were on the senior panel that were the editorial panel providing the scrutiny and challenge and examination and balance for the review. Great, thank you. No, and, and there has obviously been a, a great variety in responses to the report. Um, do you think that the relationship, any relationships have been damaged for example, between SNH and um, deer management groups. And how do you see going forward that relationship being strengthened? Uh, I'll pick that up, but I think again, Donald is closer to, to them, and I, but I think I would accept that this has, uh, has strained the relationships because when you say something that is uncomfortable or and perhaps not expected, that's bound to be an outcome. But it certainly wasn't an intention of SNH. We, we, um, acknowledge the input that the deer industry has made to this process and we know that there are no solutions that can be found that don't involve them very closely in next steps so i think that's what we certainly look, wish to put that on record but donald is certainly closer to this i mean i think that we have generally a good relationship with admg we have some good discussion with them we have robust discussions with them and we have good involvement with the local deer management groups so through our local area officers um, whether that's wildlife management officers and area officers, uh, we have a good relationship there. I think that that, that that relationship remains. There's no doubt that the report has pointed to areas where uh, the industry and some of the deer management groups have to look forward. And I guess it's looking at the basis of, of what, what, what is the way forward, what are the points that need to be addressed, where does the, where's the next steps in that, and to make sure that staff within our, our organisation and the DMGs and those in the lowland uh, are engaged in that process. What, what, just one last one. What, what do you, in terms of next steps, have you got any suggestions or ideas for, for next ten steps to strengthen that relationship? So, uh, I mean, I think at, at a very practical level, the, the report has highlighted the areas where there, there is weakness. Uh, so there's some uh, more work required in terms of some of the environmental aspects that need to be looked at in terms of deer management planning. We've also gone through it quite a robust process over the last couple of years looking at developing deer management plans. That plans are now being implemented and that's a very important point is that we're in that process now of implementation and it's where that's where our staff, our, our role can, can benefit that in working with deer management groups, working with individuals uh, and working in the lowlands to identify that next steps, making sure that we are clear on what is being asked and that there is a kind of clear route in terms of, of the way forward of working together. Of, of, of the way forward, and this is not a criticism because you're perfectly entitled to, to stand by the report, but if you're sitting today saying we wouldn't redraw our conclusions, we stand by them, 
it becomes very difficult, I would suggest, given that the other side of this argument is equally as polarised in coming together to find a way forward. Is that not a concern? I'm not suggesting that you should admit to something you don't believe is the case, but it does seem to strike me that we've got two arguments at different ends of this. I think that, 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 that is the issue in front of us in a nutshell, is that people do come from, to this issue, I'm almost tempted to call it a problem though, but this issue with different perspectives. And their perspectives are based often on their objectives for the land, and those objectives can be, be very broad, from a purely uh, sporting and commercial interest at one end to a purely habitat and conserv interest, conservation interest at, at, at another. And, the fact that people have different objectives, um, we do try to address through some of the documents we have, the Wild Deer National Approach, a Good Deer uh, Management Guidelines and so on, uh, but these themselves don't reconcile the different objectives. And I think the next steps must involve a closer dialogue about that objective setting, and we need to establish a context within which that can be done uh, openly and fairly. Okay, let's move on and look at research in the logic exchange. We've touched on that already, but I think uh, Emma Harper has a, a question. Okay, thanks, Convener. Um, we've reviewed a lot of evidence in the last few weeks, and even the academics were here last week, but as I've learned more about deer management, I see that it doesn't seem that anything was considered about like immunocontraception or using you know, these porcine products that prevent deer from getting pregnant, and maybe that would be a, a less emotive way to dealing with urban deer rather than shooting them. I'm just wondering if any of these methods of biological surgical interventions were considered because it, because it wasn't explored in the report. In, in terms of the evidence we reviewed, they were the five key data sets. Um, there, what you've talked about, about the potential for the future control of deer through alternative methods rather than culling, is an area of future research about how you would apply it, what um, society might feel is tolerable, and the actual, there's been developments recently about the technology involved in um, providing immunocontraception. But we didn't provide it as a review of the, res of the data sets because there is no information uh, about using it as a control method. Then, that on an ongoing basis, SNH ought to be looking at because you know we heard an evidence talk about instead of fencing everything, you could use these laser devices, you know, to scare deer off, etc. So there's, it's always it, there's technology and, and approaches evolving. So surely that's something that you should be on top of as the agency with responsibility for deer management. Well, wants to come in. It, it is something that we are considering, and in fact, at our next meeting of our science advisory committee, we're anticipating taking a paper on immunocontraception um, for further discussion. I mean, there are all sorts of issues around its use and applicability and effectiveness, but it's one of several techniques that we've been considering, along with a variety of remote sensing techniques uh, for counting deer, other techniques uh, for assessing habitat conditions. So there's a whole battery of techniques that we will be considering. But on your specific point, we will be taking that to our science advisory committee. Yeah, I mean, I'd just like to, to emphasize what, what um, Dave said there, in that we are looking at that. We have looked at that in the past. It is an issue that does come up, especially in regard to lowland deer, where we're trying to do management in an urban context. Um, but there are a number of considerations you have to take in. The practical considerations, the resource considerations, and most importantly, the welfare considerations of using that type of approach. Uh, and there are constraints to that, um, which we have found. Thanks. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, could I turn our minds to um, lowland deer management? Um, obviously a very complex issue which we've taken a lot of evidence on um, in this uh, committee and in the previous session, um, not least in a session in the borders. Um, could, could I uh, ask uh, the panel, could I ask you about the efficacy of the current structures for lowland deer management and just very quickly highlight one or two points that were raised on the 22nd of November to us in committee. Um, Ian Ross said, we do not have a collaborative approach in large areas of lowland Scotland. This is a challenge that we need to address. Um, and then um, Eileen Stewart said, SNH, I quote, uh, making sure that the current patchy performance of local authorities is improved. 
and uh, stress that we do not yet have a model. And on the 13th um, of December uh, of last year, um, Richard Playfair um, highlighted, I quote, I would like to think that we promote their, the membership's views, that's the Lowland Deer Network Scotland, uh, but we do not necessarily know what their views are at any given time. So um, this is really um, something that we would appreciate as a committee, your comment on uh, perhaps more on the way forward, but if you have any comments on, on uh, the remarks that I've quoted or other issues about where we are now, that would be helpful as well. Kick off with that. In terms of the, uh, the, the specific comments uh, on the collaborative approach, um, we're dealing with a very different context in the lowlands than we are in the uplands. We're dealing with different species of deer, a different land ownership pattern. And the collaborative approach that is applicable in the uplands of Scotland is, may not be the solution in the lowlands, and probably isn't the solution in the lowlands uh, for that very reason in terms of that two, two issues. Um, in terms of engagement with the local authorities, that is something that, uh, through the code of practice, there is a duty on public agencies to take account of the, of the code of practice. And to be honest, we do struggle with engagement with the local authorities in terms of deer management. Um, and that's down to their resource requirements, their priorities. Um, but they are significant landowners in, the, in, in these lowland areas. Um, and it is something that we are actively looking at. We've got a sharing good practice event, which is coming up very shortly, uh, to try and better help the, the local authorities understand what the, what the duty in terms of the code is, but also understand what the, the, the practical are implications of, of that means. In terms of the LDNS, um, it is a forum for uh, deer managers and deer management interests in the low grounds. It is not the equivalent of uh, the deer management group structure in, in the north. Um, it is a useful forum in terms of getting that information across there, such as education, such as some of the, you know, the, in terms of the public's attitudes to deer, understanding about what the drivers are, uh, for deer management in the lowlands um, and making sure we've got that broad range of uh, engagement with, with the different people who are involved. Um, but the, the nature of that task is quite big. Um, the approaches need to be developed. We're do, looking at developing a pilot study, which is going on shortly, or, or has started, in terms of looking at the levels of public interest within the lowland areas to see what the approaches that are in place currently uh, and looking where the gaps are. And quite a lot of that gaps are in our knowledge. So in, in terms of we've got good information on census and population work, largely in the, in the upland areas, we don't have a lot of that information uh, in, in the lowlands. And that's some of the barriers and constraints to management. But just to be clear, in terms of understanding whether there is a problem in the lowlands, it is something that, that we've heard through some of the discussion. I don't think we can be clear that there is a problem, but what we need to make sure is that we're not creating a problem and that we've got a lot of work going on in terms of habitat management, uh, woodland expansion in the lowland areas, and that's prime uh, habitat for deer in the future. And we need to make sure we're managing and planning for that. Would you accept that the relationship between SNH Transport Scotland and Forestry Commission, in so much as you fund, as I understand it, the lowland deer network, organisation may be part of the problem that it's it's more focused on looking at you you as its funders and the, your views your needs rather than engaging with its members and listening to possibly possible innovative approaches so i don't think so uh, I, I think i would repeat that in terms of the, the the structure of that and richard cook is chair of the admg actually chairs the lowland deer network so it's quite an open forum in terms of the, 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 the agency funding is really there to promote that engagement, promote that discussion. Um, it's got quite a wide membership with quite a wide range of views on that committee. Um, and it's quite a large committee. Uh, and, and it is evolving over time to see how it can better deliver. Yeah. About, for example, you know, we've heard suggestions that, that there needs to be some different approaches developed, um, pilot projects around making greater use of well-trained recreational stalkers, for example. It's quite clear we're not getting it right when it comes to controlling the urban lowland deer issue. So don't we need to be more open-minded to, to fresh approaches? Absolutely. 
Absolutely, and I, I think that is one of the forums that we can use. Lowland Yard is one of the forums that we, we can use to do that. Um, but the, the, there is this, you know, a whole range of different planning mechanisms out there to look at that wider management at the landscape scale, even in the lowlands, is really important to understand what are the issues. Okay. Sorry, Claudia, do you have anything further to... Could, could I just come, come in quickly on that? I mean, I think when we, we, we um, were commissioned to produce this, I think a lot of people would have been surprised to find that we had put a lot of emphasis in the work on the lowland deer issues because it, it wasn't broadly seen as being the big issue. And I think what this report has done is flag up that it is actually a very much a part of the big issue. We do not have the answers at the moment. The pilot projects will certainly help us. Um, but we, we are in the infancy of dealing with deer as an asset and as a problem uh, in lowland areas. And that's the rural lowland areas as well as the urban areas. So I, I'm, we are very much open to suggestions about how we can take this part of the work forward. And I just have a, a slight concern in, uh, in you highlighting um, that the collaborative approach may not be the way forward when you think of the complex pattern of land ownership. Um, in, for instance, the region I represent, South Scotland, and if people aren't able to work together in a more formal structure, I'd be concerned about how that could go forward. And I'd also highlight that um, in South Scotland, for instance, which might be defined as lowland because it's not highland, there's often an issue about this, and that there are some very large landowners with significant estates. And uh, I wonder how they are in involved in the way that they might be that they have been involved in the good models of, of deer management groups in, in the Highlands? I think, there's, as you point out, that it's, we're not dealing with the same issue right across southern Scotland, and, and I tend to think of the large part of southern Scotland being upland anyway. But, uh, and the land ownership pattern is very much a part of that. But we have estimated, I mean, there are tens of thousands of individuals who, will, who are responsible for deer management on their land, and that's a very different picture to dealing with the relatively smaller number in the highlands. So I, I, I won't, don't want to put words into my chairman's mouth, um, but I think we can't adopt the same collaborative approach. But Clearly, it has to be a collaborative approach. And I think one of the tricks will be engaging that very big potential audience, but not burdening ourselves with a bureaucracy of trying to micromanage such a large number of people. And I think you know, there is a genuine issue that we haven't resolved there. Thank you. Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, convener. Just thinking about a uh, shared vision of what deer management can achieve. Um, do you think it's clear to deer management groups what they're supposed to achieve on their patch in terms of public interest objectives, and who decides on that? So, I mean, I, I think there's been a lot of work done done on that through the, through the starting from the, the deer strategy and also the deer code that was published in 2012 helped distill kind of what the public interest is that we're looking at. And actually SNH did a bit more work to help develop the assessment process for deer management groups, which again kind of distilled down what, what the ask is of deer management groups. And through the deer management planning process, I think this latest round of deer management planning process in the Uplands has actually been... Uh, has, has moved us forward in terms of understanding what the public interest and what that public interest is at the local scale, because there will be different priorities in terms of the public interest from Sutherland to Inverness or to the, the West. And it's, it's making sure that there's a clear understanding of what those, those broad public interests are, but what is the importance at that local scale. And I think we've gone a long way to, to that. I was just going to add, because your question was asked quite specifically at the deer management group, so I didn't want to detract from that, and Donald was best placed to tell you that. But I did want to say, and again, some commentators have picked it up, and it was picked up as one of the research gaps by the SRUC work, um, is that there seems to be a lack of awareness of the high-level vision um, that is set out in the national policy, wild deer and national approach. And it's interesting that that was picked up as a research gap because it does exist. There is a national policy, there is a vision, um, and uh, 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 the priorities and challenges have been set out and there's an annual action plan that is on a shared website where all partners and stakeholders can inform and interact with what they're doing to take forward the priorities and the vision. But um, it is notable from the research gaps that we obviously need to do more about communicating what that overarching vision is. But it's a slightly different question than you asked specifically. Mm -hmm. 
Um, do deer management groups have the skills and resources to achieve these public interest objectives and also what help, guidance and funding is available uh, for those uh, deer management groups? I, I wouldn't underestimate the challenge in some of this. So there, there is a big challenge there in delivering the public interest and the resource element is significant in that. Um, that's both in terms of time and effort that, that goes into that, but also in terms of resources that, that you know, cost, uh, cash resources that are going into that as well. I mean, the, the primary mechanism for, for delivering the public interest is largely through the Scottish Rural Development Programme through SRD, SRDP uh, and some of the other funding schemes to incentivise some of that. But, you know, it is limited in terms of, of, of what that can deliver. Um, and, you know, the, the priorities there are set in terms of through the SRD pro, SRDP programme about what where that can be delivered. So there are challenges there, uh, certainly in terms of the resources required to deliver that. That, but we need to be clear, also clear about what can be delivered and what time scale over what we're delivering. So uh, there's some big questions in there, but the, the, the planning process that we've gone through has helped try and articulate what can be done and within the, the time skills that we're looking at. So in terms of uh, the level of support and particularly the level of funding, um, has that remained the same uh, over the period? Has there, any, uh, has there been any new initiatives? It's just so that we can you know, gather versus you know, what we're seeing in the report and what either we might have uh, expected to see going forward as well. Come in there yeah. as well. I mean, we didn't carry out a, a review of the incentives that are available, and um, I was really pleased to hear your question because it is an essential area that would benefit from some further thorough analysis about what's available. We provided a summary of the SRDP funding, but that is not the full picture. And you know, one of the areas specifically um, that both the research gaps project. Um, and that our own experience has picked up and that um, ADMG have mentioned is that they need more help in carrying out habitat impact assessments. So how do we resource that and incentivise that in the right way? I think it needs further work. Funding in relation to habitat uh, monitoring that's, that's available and, and when has that come online, if so? It comes through. The, there is funding available largely for designated sites, so it's largely for our, our, our designated sites that is available through the SRDP uh, option. Um, for, for the wider countryside, there is less opportunity for that, that uh, support uh, to be delivered. Yeah. Okay. We were able to inject a small level of funding to over the last couple of years to assist with the management planning process. To, to add to that, it was clear from the evidence that Professor McCracken gave last week that for the SRUC having carried out their review, clearly uh, more effort and more resource needs to go into developing habitat impact assessments, working with deer management groups and members so that we're much clearer about the sorts of adjustments and deer management that are needed to meet different objectives. It sounds easy. On the ground, it's incredibly complex. And Professor Alban, in his evidence, also described what happens when sheep numbers are reduced and how that actually results in deer having a heavier impact on some of the habitats. So we, we should face up to the fact here that we're dealing with a very complex situation, very complex management objectives. And if we're going to move matters forward, we need to put a real resource into training up um, Deer management groups and having uh, sort of adequate resourcing of monitoring. Mark Ruskell. I mean, we heard some evidence last week about the rate of delivery of public objectives, and I think the comment was made that um, you know public objectives have been set. Um, deer management groups are, are working to implement these, but it's still early days. Um, so, but I think my understanding of, of your report is that you're calling for the step change in terms of delivery of public objectives, not necessarily reduction in deer density. So how do we, how do you accelerate that? Funding's obviously part of that, but and would you, are you expecting more in terms of rate of delivery at this point, given that it still is relatively early days in terms of the establishment of these objectives? Well, I think part of it is about being clear about the objectives and the sort of management we need in order to meet these objectives. And that in itself is very challenging, actually. And that's, that's a very important dialogue that we've been developing with the deer management groups. 
I think one of the things that hopefully does come out in, in our report clearly is that where you've got uh, the skills on the ground, you've got a deer management group which has got the sense a bit between the teeth, they can produce some extremely good results over a relatively short time in terms of the management planning process and we would hope and expect that to be translated into implementation. So there is a model there uh, which we know can be made to work. What we have across the spectrum of the deer management groups, and again, I think what comes out clearly in the report, is that you have the other end of that spectrum <clears throat> where there is almost next to no delivery against the public objectives. Teasing out why that is the case, uh, I think we need to, to look at. We, we, we can't just go to those groups and criticise blindly. We have, is, it, is it a capacity issue? Is it an expertise issue? Is it a funding issue? We need to understand from their perspective why they were not able to come up to a, a higher standard. Then I think we would probably be able to target effort resource, incentives, support, regulation at those groups who then are finding it difficult to move on. A charitable view, is it not? Because what you've missed out of that interpretation is an unwillingness issue. To what extent, in reality, is the problem that there is an unwillingness either uh, over the, the group itself or perhaps individual participants in the group to get down to dealing with this? I, I'm going to, to, to answer that, but I'm going to uh, put, put a marker down that you're asking us to go beyond what the evidence tells us, because this is not a, was not a behavioural study that we did in that sense. Uh, so we can only answer that... Based on interpretation uh, on it, you've, you've <coughs> listed things that you think are factors. I'm yes. just suggesting that may be overly charitable. There may be other issues at play. Uh, it, it, but I want just to put on the record, what I'm going to say is not uh, an evidence-based answer in that sense, it's a more qualitative-based answer mm. from experience okay. over many years, is that you're absolutely right. Uh, there are people who have a whole spectrum of objectives and interests, and some are simply not interested in the spectrum of interests that deer represents. Some are much more focused on one or maybe two of those, th those outcomes. Now, in a sense, one might argue that was reasonable, uh, looking from their perspective, but looking from the public interest perspective, it will not do any longer. And in terms of the natural heritage, which is clearly the direction we've come from, what we say, and I think this is why our conclusion we would stand by it, is we haven't got the evidence that those groups will move forward entirely on a willing basis. Now, so, which is why we need to establish all of the reasons they might not before targeting those for whom that it may be, uh, you know, being less charitable, they don't want to do it. OK, that's useful to get that on the record. Uh, Jenny Goldruth. Um, in terms of deer counts and trends, um, last week there was a bit of debate with regard to uh, what the total deer number is, and obviously the report puts it at somewhere between 360,000 and 400,000, which is quite a difference. Um, and last week the panel members were keen to emphasise the importance of trends uh, versus uh, the total number. So I just wanted to ask, um, do you think that the work with the James Hutton Institute is going to provide a more accurate and reliable uh, number going forward? And secondly, there was a suggestion last week um, that there should be local counts conducted every five years um, to provide more accurate and up-to-date readings, I suppose. Um, would you agree with that? Uh, on, on both points, yes, but certainly in terms of the evidence I was here, I, I heard the evidence as presented. I think James Hutton Institute have done an excellent job. And in terms of the trends they're reporting, they're superb. We're looking forward now to finding out what's driving differences in trends across the country. And they mentioned sheep densities, changes in climate. Um, so I think in terms of a deer population estimate, it would be very helpful to have that. Indeed, there's a statutory obligation requiring us to have that. But what is much more important is having an understanding of variation in trends across the country and the impacts of these trends on the natural heritage interests. And that's what we're heading towards. Thank you. Counting frequency? On the count uh, issue. So, I mean, historically, the Red Deer Commission, they did a rolling, a rolling programme of counts which went round the country every five or six years uh, in, a, in a, a basis like that. So we had fairly up-to-date data wh which uh, was available. Uh, in terms of the priorities in the kind of early 2000s, where our, our count programme was more focused on designated sites due to delivering the favourable condition targets. And there's a conscious decision to do that. Over the last two or three years, we have kind of gone back to a policy of trying to get round the deer management groups from an S&H perspective in terms of our count programme to do that. Um, 
And we do put resource into that, and it's quite, quite a lot of resource that goes into that in terms of supporting the DR management groups through that. Um, and, uh, and that's an expensive process. Um, but through the DR management planning uh, round that's going on, clearly DR counts and DR census information is an important part of that. So in going forward, hopefully we've got a better position where we may still have a, an SNH count programme, but we'll also have the, the DR management group counts, which will become on board so that that, that stream can continue. Is there not an argument in terms of, of amassing a, a baseline and a set of data that's reliable, that if you could get the DMGs to do what uh, Jenny Ruth has suggested, you could then focus your resources in the areas where we don't have deer management groups so that we got a better picture? That's not a criticism of the approach you're taking, but I just make it as an observation. I think what we do at the moment is a reflection of quite a long-standing good relationship with the deer management groups in us, and that's an area which the, uh, the Deer Commission and then SNH have supported. I think it is open to question as to whether that is the best use of a public resource to count in those areas, given that we've now opened the whole issue of deer across the whole of Scotland, and particularly there are bigger unknowns in terms of deer numbers and impacts probably in the lowlands now. So I think it's a very good question, one we, we will need to address. Um, Maybe not the moment to put it on the record, but obviously SNH resource is very finite, and, and tackling all of these issues uh, may have to be sequential on the current current resource base because dealing with them all at the same time will stretch us very severely. Okay, well, let's um, <coughs> Alexander Burnett. I know he's wanting to come in with a question, but let's let's develop the resource theme right now. Um, a number of witnesses have commented about the your um, ability. To, to take on the responsibilities you've had you know, from a financial from a staffing point of view. Now, I recognise you're a body that um, is funded by the Scottish Government, but let's pretend this isn't being filmed or there's no official report. And let's see if we can get down to some... Uh, I, I, I realise it's stretching it, but let's see where we... Um, how are you sufficiently well resourced to do what you need to do to oversee the kind of dear management we need in Scotland? You can ask something while you're gathering your thoughts. Um, I mean, it depends. Uh, it's a bit of a circular answer, so apologies for this. Um, but it depends what it is um, Scottish Government want us to do. They will set out what it is we need to do, and we will do that. So it is a circular... You know, we currently have been asked to support the deer management groups with their plans, and so that's what we've done. We're setting out the counts. If, as a result of this review... The feeling is that the pace of change needs to be speeded up, which is what some of the questions have been about, um, and it demands us to do more work, well, then there will be a, a greater demand on our resources. I, I, one of I'm Dave, sure. Dave Stewart in here, but just yeah. let's develop something that came out in uh, evidence. Um, what you're saying is what we've been told before, that basically you've got the resource to do what you're doing now, but if there was to be further policy, then it would be more challenging. Get that, absolutely. But some of the evidence we took suggested that you had, as an organisation, you'd gone to the DMGs and you said, there's a piece of work coming down the track, we can't afford it because of cuts, and they've put their hands in the po their pockets to the tune of £65,000. Now, that to me suggests that you're not sufficiently well resourced to do what you're doing now. I, 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 Donald may want to get into some specifics, but I, and you asked me to assume there would be no official record. I'm sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> um, so what I would say, I would be happy to say in, on the official record, uh, SNH is asked to do an enormous range of things. Uh, here we are today talking about deer, but even within the uplands, we could be talking about other species with, that, that are an, uh, an issue one way or another, or we could be looking at marine environment and marine monitoring or ac access and recreation and so on. The, the, our remit is extremely broad. Uh, our budget has gone down by 30% in the last uh, six years. So it is impossible for us to do everything that we used to do or that we and the Deer Commission used to do. Uh, and I think we would have to say we've had to to cut the cloth accordingly. So we no longer do as much in terms of monitoring. Our monitoring program is more spaced out than it used to be. Uh, we can't be on the ground to support every action that people are taking and giving advice in the way that we used to be because we don't have as many people to do it. So I'm bound to say that if more is being asked of SNH here, it will be a case of choices, which I think is what Claudia was saying. Um, and if we're given clear priorities, 
then we will make our choices accordingly. Uh, and I think that is the, um, you know, my chief executive and chairman were in front of you, again, not that long ago, and probably made that point, that we, we can do only so much, and it's knowing what is most important that we have to look to uh, government to give us advice on. Okay. Or, in, in fact, instruction. Thank you. Dave. Can we just touch on something I was, I was going to go into? But if we go back into history, you mentioned the amalgamation, I think, six years ago um, with the Deer Commission and, S and SNH. Um, first point was, of course, there was an extra objective added, which was about sustainable deer management. So you had more to do. You wouldn't have these figures um, in your head um, necessarily. But how, how do these staffing figures compare with the regular commission and the commission and what you now have? And to partly answer my own question, you'll know from evidence um, from Alec Hogg, and I paraphrase on the 13th of December, he said that of 500 staff, only 12 deal exclusively with, uh, with deer, and staff who work in deer are underrepresented. And we've done a, another check through DCS, and we make it as around 17 staff if you take admin and IT out. I mean, that doesn't seem to me to be a lot of staff. Roughly, how does that compare with what the Red Deer Commission and the Deer Commission? I think Donald Fraser worked for these organisations. He might not know the figures in his head, but... Because we'll give them, otherwise we might have to supply those separately. But... I don't have the I don't have the, have the figures with me, but uh, I mean I think you know part part of the merger of the DCS and the SNH was about making efficiencies as well, so that that needs to be taken into account in terms of some of the senior staff and some of the some of the support staff that were involved in the Deer Commission will not be a, a straight read across to the, to the but in terms of technical staff, um, the staff complement that was with the Deer Commission transferred into SNH, we have lost. A, num a number of these staff due to due to retirements and the rest of it in terms of wasted which some of it's not been replaced but also we have in terms of our approach to deer management we look to deliver that through the areas that the seven snh areas that snh have so in terms of the staff resource available to deal with deer margin that's increased uh, substantially uh, through the merger in terms of how that skills and knowledge have been transferred, there's been an ongoing programme over the last five years to try and do that. So the potential staff resource is significantly greater than it was with the Deer Commission. Could you perhaps send us the figures from the Red Deer Commission days and then the Deer Commission days? It would be useful to compare and contrast, Absolutely. bearing in mind that there is, there is extra objectives. And the other point that um, I, I, was, I would be useful for you to determine, I mean, do you require, not just staffing, but do you require extra powers to deal with uh, your objectives? if that was something that you could get. I mean, it moves us on to some of the next steps. And again, we didn't look at, um, you know, as part of our review, we didn't look at whether for how the existing powers are operating. And it's quite a complex suite of powers, some of which, you know, we haven't used. And um, I think uh, we'll probably be emboldened by uh, the process that we've gone through here to uh, use some of our powers in the future. But uh, I think it would benefit from some further careful look at how the existing suite are all in position, what the new powers are under the Land Reform Act given to us, and a, a bit more analysis on how you might streamline that and is it sufficient. And we haven't done that piece of work. It's of use them or lose them. Well, but I can't answer you whether we need additional powers until you really have had a proper look and spoken to different practitioners about what the impact might be and how you might approach it. And my final question, convener, is, is obviously looking at best practice in other countries is useful and Norway is often quoted. Is the funding method there for deer management something that's attractive to you within SNH? Is that something we can look at best practice and incorporate in Scotland? I think yes, certainly with some of it. And we, we heard about that from, from Duncan Halley in terms of the centralising uh, of record keeping on, on weights of, of culled stags and some of the other information. And a number of us have, have, have worked with people in NINA, the other Norwegian authorities, and there's a lot we can learn from there. And we have a very good working relationship with, with Duncan and, and colleagues. So we're always uh, open to suggestions as to how we can improve things. And, you know, we, we try, try and do that. Thank you, Kavir. That raises a, a, a question, I guess, around, um, and you've touched upon this in some way earlier on, um, this report is a kind of review of where we're at. But I'm interested in, in you know, what sort of work you do on a day-to-day -day basis developing possible future policy to, to draw to the attention of the Scottish Government? Because, you know, um, 
as you've just touched upon, there are other countries doing it perhaps differently, better, whatever. So what sort of work streams are going on away from this um, that informs the approach to deer management? I mean, one example I can give you actually is on the habitat impact assessments. If, if anything, we've, we've been out to Norway to share the work that we've, we're doing in Scotland um, to help them develop um, some of the techniques uh, as one example. And of course, through these, these visits, you, you pick up a lot of important additional information in terms of the approaches that they're using. So a lot of use of remote sensing, for instance, for assessing vegetation cover as well as, as counting deer, something we can use. Later on, we touched upon, uh, in relation to, to Emma Harper's question about some other work you were doing. So just, I'd, I'd like to get a feel for the record about what is the process around deer management. Do you kind of instigate pieces of work, you pull the ideas together, do you then take that to government? How does it work if we're going to be progressing the whole deer management um, sort of regime? It goes, it goes back to the deer strategy and the, and the action plan that comes from the deer strategy. So that is the driver for the work that we undertake and the work that we undertake in partnership with other organisations. Um, but but that, that sets the basis for the, the, the different work programmes that we're doing. Clearly, there's, there's ongoing work that's been done over the last number of years, but it's looking at that. It also looks at that kind of more innovative work that we need to do in the uplands, but, but most, more importantly in the lowlands for some of the work that we're doing. Um, and that, that action plan is a clear driver for that. Okay, uh, Alexander Bonner, I'll let you in now. Apologies. <laughs> uh, thank you, convener. Can I just note my register of interest relating to deer management? Um, just coming back to the report, um, there's appear from the previous sessions to be in a clear consensus that the impacts of grazing are more important than the densities. Um, I'm just wondering how you'd respond to criticism that the report associates too much environmental impact with deer and too little with other herbivores. I mean, I did pick up some of that um, misunderstandings, I think, and the misinterpretation around the data sets, which we acknowledge is complex. Um, and it was in relation to the impacts of woodlands. And I, I did touch on that earlier, so I won't repeat that. I think we do also acknowledge um, that it is difficult in a practical sense on the ground to distinguish between sheep and um, deer without recourse to other evidence. But I was, um, pre in preparing for this, talking to Donald about the experience at a place like Cairn Lochan. And we know there that there are 200 sheep and we know that there are many thousands of deer. So there are ways um, of assessing, what the, uh, distinguishing uh, herbivore impacts when you actually know what either the counts are or, or the stocking levels. But I think um, SRUC did pick it up in their research gaps that it might be something we need to look at further information uh, to help surveyors assess the difference. But certainly in terms of the Native Woodland Survey, in most of the cases, they did manage to distinguish the difference, and it's quite significant between the 73% attributed to deer and 15% attributed to livestock. I mean, just to add Does to that, that, we're very, absolutely, we're very careful on this. If we're not sure, we say so. Um, but if we, we're finding deer pellets uh, and other evidence of deer grazing or browsing, then we attribute the, the damage to deer. But if there's any doubt, we say so. Just ask for the purpose of God, is there any um, suspicion that some of the criticism around this may relate to the whole Section 8 issue, whereby you have to be able to prove beyond any and all reasonable doubt that the impacts are caused by deer only before you can pursue a Section 8. So I just wonder if is there any element of muddying the waters around this issue? Uh, I've, I've, I mean, I've come to, come to that point to link the evidence to the, um, to the powers. Uh, I think in the past, and I think SNH would need to take criticism on the chin here, uh, that we perhaps haven't used those powers or pushed the use of those powers as quickly as we might. But our hand has some, sometimes been stayed by uh, threats that our evidence base is not good enough and therefore there would be a challenge. Uh, they would be very expensive to follow through. They're not a one-off fix. If you go into a Section 8, you are in probably for the long haul. You're not in today and out tomorrow. So it's not a quick fix. And I think for all of those reasons, reasons, the, uh, and particularly this issue of the firmness of the evidence, um, we have perhaps been less willing to take a risk with that use of that legislation than perhaps we will be tomorrow. 
Sorry, Alexander. <clears throat> Back to the, to the scrutiny of the report. Do you think so, you, you say that SIUC will pick up some of that impact on, on herbivores and in, impact? Do you think some of this would have been picked up? Well, one of the problems is it hasn't been picked up because the expert reviewing it didn't have any, doesn't have any previous experience in either deer or other herbivores. Because other experts have been involved in producing the report. There's been no shortage of experts advising on this. And indeed, um, we've been in dialogue with SRUC whilst they've been producing their report. I mean, Davy McCracken, who was here, uh, is on the expert panel of our science advisory committee. So that is not an issue. OK, fine. Uh, Angus MacDonald. OK, thanks, um, convener. Um, we've already spoken about um, the situation in, in Norway. Um, and we've, we've covered uh, the issues relating to um, uh, deer management. However, Dr Duncan Halley stated last week that the Norwegian system has been effective in managing the resource at sustainable levels. Uh, plus, he also stated that the system in Norway is uncontroversial and has broad public support. Now, you've already stated that you've picked up some ideas uh, from visiting Norway um, but is it fair to say that Norway's got it right and we haven't? Um, and what other aspects can we take on board? I say Norway hasn't got it right. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, from what we can see uh, on the ground and talking with the experts out there, they have a system that works extremely well. I mean, I heard what Duncan said and it absolutely mirrored uh, my own understanding. But the situation is perhaps less complex uh, in terms of land ownership and management than we have in Scotland. I was going to make that same point, Convener. I think we, we can't look at a single solution that's going to work in Sutherland and also work in Galloway and uh, let alone in the, in the central belt. We, the, the Norwegian model may work for part of that uh, and not work for other parts. I think we also have to acknowledge that, that not only is their land ownership system very different, so they, they have experienced um, much more extreme seesawing in their rural economy in terms of agriculture in the last century that, that, than we did, and all of these things have played a part in uh, them evolving their system. I, I think in Scotland we need to evolve our own system, but learn from the best experience across Europe. Okay, thanks. To be fair, I think Dr Halley did uh, stress that in his evidence last week. Uh, finally, uh, Morris Colton. Thank you, Convener. Um, there's obviously been a lot of criticism of the report from stakeholders, and we've covered lots of that um, today already. But I was just looking to the future. What do you think is the way forward in terms of uh, linking with those stakeholders to ultimately achieve the objectives of the Scottish Government? We have a, a number of next steps in, in mind, and I think, Claudia, probably is a good moment to, to, to say about one or two things about that. I'll touch on them. Um, I would just like to add as well, in terms of the criticisms you've highlighted and we've um, highlighted as well, it did quite a few commentators have said it was a comprehensive and robust review that uh, not just ourselves. But to um, pick up your um, uh, suggestions about what our suggested thoughts are on next steps, we've touched on many of them in the discussion already. And I think um, in, in terms of the areas we think the review has really stimulated um, discussion about where next steps might lead. Um, there's an obvious area around ongoing progress and monitoring of the deer management group's plans and the implementation of those plans. Um, there is something that needs doing, and we've discussed on what some of the issues are about taking forward um, work in the lowlands, and uh, it's not clear, and there's not an obvious and agreed solution what that is, and I think um, a little bit of further work is needed to make sure we do what is the most effective thing for the situation in Scotland. And the other area that has attracted quite a lot of um, debate and suggestion and has come from various commentators is that we need to do more on setting cull targets. Um, what is not clear is, and it's certainly not agreed, um, what is whether that is needed, what it would achieve, and if you then thought it was needed, what would be the most effective way of doing it? So again, I think that is an area where it would be useful to have further time to make sure we made the right decisions rather than rushing into something. Those are three particular areas that um, the discussions that you've heard here seem to have cropped up, but obviously welcome to hear your own thoughts. Uh, I mean, um, the convener, you mentioned there is 
of course, other work going on on deer management outside the um, scope of the review. And in particular, we've mentioned that today, and we very much wanted to reiterate that the uh, Wild Deer National approach uh, is in place. It sets out the priorities and challenges for this five-year period. It is a 20-year vision, and there's an annual action plan um, with indicators, which we are currently going on and reporting on. So that will be ongoing, which doesn't isn't stimulated as a result of the review. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for your attendance and your evidence today. That's been most useful. Um, at its next meeting on the 31st of January, the committee will take evidence from stakeholders on the Scottish Government's draft climate change plan. The committee will also consider petition PE one. Sorry. Is petition, sorry, petition PE1615 on state regulated licensing uh, of game bird hunting in Scotland and the review of PE1601 on European beavers in Scotland. As agreed earlier, we will now move into private session. I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed.